Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter This episode was recorded before Joel Schumacher passed away in June of 2020. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hi, everybody. We've made it. (laughs) Access granted. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) That was the most disturbingly sexy access granted in that movie. I just am wondering, is that the voice of Peg? Oh. Oh. Mm. We'll get there. Gross. We'll get there. Joining us is a returning guest who I am now in the same room as, again, because of like our slow burn episode, my internet just was so sucky. <laughs> Technology. You're I, welcome, Noel. I, had, I know, right? I didn't have the flashy CD-ROMs of this movie. <laughs> yeah. yes. Joining us again, Melissa Kirscher. Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me back for this glorious movie. <laughs> So, Melissa, since the last time, what was the last one we had you on for? Flatliners, right? Flatliners. Flatliners. That's right. Flatliners. Oh, yes. The two-part. Oh, yes. New with Deluxe Flatliners. Yes. By the way, quick follow-up. The Netflix series, The OA, is basically what I was hoping for from a Flatliners TV series. Ooh. Very good show. I'm about halfway through it right now. Okay. It's very much dealing with flatlining and near-death experiences, but like pushing it even further. Okay. Very awesome. good show. Okay. I like it. So, have you had any other Joel Schumacher experiences since then? No, I don't think I have. Okay. Yeah. Just this morning when I, when I rewatched <laughs> Batman and Robin. <laughs> so what you've been up to lately? What shows are you still putting out? Still putting out Real Education. And I'm doing live theater around town here and there and so on and so forth. That's about it at the moment. Taking a break, taking it easy for mm-hmm. the moment. Learning Kung Fu. Nice. nice. Yeah. Thank you. That's my latest thing is learning Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> you know Kung Fu. I don't know it yet. I'm learning it. I am very uncoordinated at the moment. (laughs) As someone who is also very uncoordinated, I can sit with (laughs) So we are here to discuss Batman and Robin. Yep. We have reached the milestone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And what a milestone it is. It is literally, we mentioned on Batman Forever, it's like nothing will ever be the same afterwards. Well, this even further cements that. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is the double down. Right. Woof. Not much to add on the production history, because it's pretty much everyone who was involved in Batman and Forever. I know you weren't there for that one, Mm -hmm. Melissa, but just to break up a few myths and misconceptions that some people have about the production of this movie. While yes, it is true that Joel was always hoping to do kind of a more psychological crime drama, and he always wanted to do year one, it's long been postulated that the studio forced his hand on the direction that he went with this movie. That's not true. He was not contracted for a sequel. They actually came to him, and he knew from the start when he signed on that they wanted a colorful, toyetic kids movie. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. He fully says, even on the DVDs, he was fully on board for exactly the type of movie that they wanted him to make. There's a lot of people who have been throwing around over the years that I know Joel Schumacher has apologized for Mm -hmm. this, that the DVD features, the commentary and documentary, it's just Joel Schumacher spending two hours apologizing. No, he only apologizes twice, once (laughs) in the commentary, once in the documentary. And he specifically says to anyone who enjoyed Batman forever, but were disappointed in Batman and Robin, he apologizes to them. I accept that apology. (laughs) Otherwise, he knew exactly what he was making. He stands by the film. He had fun making the film. It's exactly the type of film he wanted to make. It's not really a case of Joel Schumacher regrets Batman and Robin. It's like, no, Mm -hmm. he still got to work with a lot of fabulous designers and had a fun time making it. And so just want to get that myth out of the way. Mm. So Batman and Robin, it was, again, written by Akiva Goldsman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Melissa, what are your thoughts on Akiva Goldsman? I am not fond of him as a film writer, but from what I've heard just recently from people I know who know him, he's apparently a perfectly fine guy. Yeah. And apparently has a sense of humor. So that's good. I appreciate Mm -hmm. that. I'm not a fan of this script (laughs) in this movie. (laughs) 
<laughs> we'll get there, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll definitely get there because I've read the script. Mm. I'm pretty sure Ikiva Goldsman is not to blame for Arnold's lines. No, they were in the script. Were they in the yeah. script? Oh, God. Well, I mean, to be th- fair, they knew they were going for Arnie. Yeah. I, again, this is a film. They all knew what they were in for. Yeah, and they just kind of ran true. With it. And also, Joel was very instrumental in the building of the script. It's not like he sent off Akiva and then, like, directed whatever Akiva okay. came. Mm-hmm. It was Joel who had the idea of doing Poison Ivy and Freeze. And he mm-hmm. was very instrumental in shaping the story of the script as they wrote it. He was very much instrumental in the tone and all the one-liners and everything. And in fact, he said a large part of the inspiration who actually chose Poison Ivy and Mr. Freeze was his eight-year-old godson. Okay. okay. Who, to this day, they're very close and he helped raise the kid. And the kid is actually in the movie as... As the kid who's part of the biker gang during the street race sequence. Ah, got it. Mm. Because Joel, he's grown up with Batman comics since the 50s. He's yeah. actually mm-hmm. followed them. He does know them. Mm-hmm. He is actually very knowledgeable in them. And him and his godson, one of their huge things was they did watch the animated series together and were huge fans of the animated series. So for a lot of people who, again, think that Joel doesn't know anything about Batman or the animated series, he knew it. He actually even dug into the DC archives to actually like dig out all the issues of Poison Ivy and all the issues of Mr. Freeze. Mm -hmm. And even there's moments in here from the animated series that they worked into the script. So without getting into the discussion of the quality of the film, I just want to emphasize it's not like Joel was forced by the studio or Joel was stuck with Akiva. This is very much Joel's movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He knew what he was making. He knew what he was in for. Yeah. I think from that, we'll go ahead and move on. And Angie, go ahead and do the synopsis if you're ready. Oh, boy. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I had what was basically commentary in here. And I was like, "Mm, maybe I should just save my thoughts for when we get to the discussion. So I tried to pare it down, but there's still just an awful lot of stuff that happens in this movie. Yeah, it's a shame we didn't do like what you did with Batman Forever, where you're just going by memory first. Yeah, I mean, I didn't watch this one many times. Yeah. So it would have been harder for me to do for this one, put it that way. We begin with close-ups of Batman and Robin putting on their suits, complete with anatomically correct bat nipples and bouncing butts, Mm -hmm. before showing the Bat Cave and the newly redesigned Batmobile. They make their way to Mr. Freeze, who is attacking a museum in order to steal a huge diamond, which he uses to power his equipment. His henchmen are referred to as the hockey team from hell, but fortunately Batman and Robin have ice skates built into their boots, so they're ready for the fight. He escapes and they follow him through all sorts of big action scenes and nearly catch him until Freeze shoots Robin with his ice gun and escapes. Dr. Pamela Isley is a scientist trying to breed animals and plants together in the interest of making the plant stronger. Dr. Jason whatever steals her venom (laughs) from her to make Bane with the idea of trying to sell super soldiers to evil world leaders. He then tries to kill Pamela, but instead just creates a variation of what happened to Catwoman in Batman Returns, making her poisonous. She kisses him and he's dead and Bane is now her henchman. Bane only speaks one word at a time and is mostly used to punch through walls. Honey! (laughs) God damn! (laughs) Monkey! (laughs) Monkey! Bomb! (laughs) Bomb! (laughs) Bomb! We learn Mr. Freeze's tragic backstory about how his wife was dying of an illness and he tried to save her, but he ended up falling into a vat of chemicals a la Joker, except this vat made his temperature 50 degrees below zero. He has to stay in cold temperatures all the time or he'll die. Mr. Freeze's grand plan is to steal diamonds to power his machines, use his machines to freeze all of Gotham in order to ransom it for billions, and use the billions to fund research to find a cure for his wife. I'm pretty sure he could just skip a couple steps there and get what he needs, but okay. Alfred is clearly not doing well himself, but no one is talking about it. Barbara Gore Wilson, (laughs) Alfred's niece, shows up from England without a trace of an English accent to visit her uncle. She loves computers and motorcycles. Bruce Wayne (laughs) donates a telescope to Gotham that connects to satellites all around the world. It is Chekhov's telescope. He also holds a benefit for the rainforest where he will show off a huge diamond in order to lure in Mr. Freeze. It also lures in Poison Ivy, who charms everyone in attendance with special pheromone dust. Batman and Robin get into a bidding war over her, Robin saying he's just going to borrow Batman's money to pay for his bids, and Batman pulling out his American Express card as the final proof that he's the richest. Expires forever. <laughs> Mr. Freeze also shows up as planned, and his condition makes him immune to Poison Ivy's charm, so she has no choice but to give him the diamond. He gets away, and the dynamic duo follow him, but they end up fighting about whether it's safe for Robin, and Batman literally kills the engine of Robin's motorcycle so he can't make a risky jump. 
Batman catches Freeze and brings him to Arkham, and then the two of them return to the Batcave and fight even more, partially about how Batman doesn't trust Robin and partially about how Ivy is just so hot and who is she more attracted to. Bruce goes to Alfred after the fight, and Alfred gives some touching counsel to him, but it's kind of ruined because Alfred is very noticeably in pain and Bruce isn't saying anything about it. He will eventually admit later that he knows and is just trying to protect Alfred's pride. Dick catches Barbara stealing one of their motorcycles for a joy ride, so he follows her and they take part in a drag race that Coolio is organizing. <laughs> <laughs> Dick catches Barbara just before she falls off a bridge to her death, and she's annoyed by it because strong female characters don't need icky boys saving them. <laughs> <laughs> Ivy, <laughs> it's hard to continue. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, that's pretty much what happened. I'm just saying. I know. I, I, I'm laughing because it's true. It's yeah, so true. Yeah, yeah. You speak the truth. I just wonder what the script conferences were like. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh God. <laughs> Ivy and Bane break Freeze out of Arkham and convince him they should work together. She's pissed to discover he has a wife, and after dispatching Batman and Robin with pheromones again, she pulls the plug on her and claims Batman did it. She entices Freeze with the idea of freezing everything and then letting her new hybrid plants take over the Earth with only the two of them left alive. So I guess either poor Bane doesn't count as human or they're just going to let him die too. Robin argues with Batman some more because Ivy totally loves him and Batman is just jealous. There's some comments in there about Batman not trusting him too, but it's completely invalidated by how incredibly dumb he comes off falling for Ivy's bullshit. Alfred can no longer hide that he's dying, and surprise, surprise, it's the same disease Freeze's wife has, just not as advanced to hers. He gives Barbara a CD meant for his brother, which she immediately hacks and finds out Batman and Robin's secret identities. When she goes to the Batcave, a Max Headroom version of Alfred, programmed into the Bat computer, tells her he's got a suit for her too, and we get another gratuitous butt shot along with her high heels and cups on her breast to hide her nipples. <laughs> Girls don't get to have nipples. No. They're there, they're just in. They're covered. It's modesty. Ah. It's her uncle, after all, who designed the suit. <laughs> to be fair, I don't think there's a single 80s or 90s comic that didn't have the nipple bumps. Right. <laughs> so they're staying true. Fair. <laughs> Yeah, but not with the little areola in the middle of it. Like, it's not just a circle. There's a circle in a circle. It's a very Sylvester costume, let's just say. <laughs> oh, okay. It turns out Robin isn't quite as dumb as he seems because he covers his lips before going to see Ivy and avoids her kiss of death. Batman follows him and they're both caught in her plants, but Batgirl swoops in to save the day. Freeze is going to use Chekhov's telescope to freeze everything over. Bane helpfully says bomb while laying bombs all around the place. <laughs> <laughs> the Bat crew all have new costumes in the next scene, no doubt to sell even more action figures, and I guess also to somehow protect them from the extreme cold. They decide that the only way to save Gotham is to use the telescope to reflect sunlight from the Congo and melt the ice. Makes perfect sense to me. Sure. Robin and Batgirl fight Bane, and eventually defeat him the only way you defeat Bane, unplugging him, <laughs> while Batman takes on Freeze. Two scientists are here to provide color commentary, too. When Batman overpowers Freeze, he sets off the bombs, and Batman managed to save himself and the scientists in just the nick of time. Batgirl programs the telescope to save everyone totally all by herself, because remember, she's a strong female character. Well, Robin couldn't figure out how to turn his screen upside down. No, it's too difficult. <laughs> Batman begs Freeze to help Alfred by telling him that his wife is still alive and he'll do everything he can to save her, too. Freeze agrees to help and hands two vials over to Batman, but would rather make a joke than actually explain how those vials are meant to be used. <laughs> Fortunately, Alfred is saved anyway. Freeze gets revenge on Ivy for trying to kill his wife, and the dynamic duo has now become a trio, though I wouldn't get your hopes up on ever seeing anything set in this franchise ever again. <laughs> Ta-da! Ta-da! And then Billy Corgan sings. And then R. Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good um, lord. Uh... So Angie... What is your history with Batman and Robin, and do you recommend it now? So, I don't have specific memories of seeing this in the theater, but I figure I probably did, just because I was so in love with Batman Forever. I do know that I definitely did not like this movie the first time I saw it. As we spoke last time, I enjoyed the silliness of Forever, but this one is just way, way too over the top. I really, really hated it back then. So I've watched it a couple more times over the years. You know, obviously it's not something I return to frequently, 
But I have to say, I don't know if I'm going a little crazy or if it's that I happen to watch a few episodes of the 60s TV show the night before to kind of give me some context. (laughs) I didn't hate it. I still have a lot of problems with it. But it's not actually the campy cheesiness that bothers me. Arnold Schwarzenegger is having the time of his life. Yeah. And it shows once you get over the shock of how different this is of what you're expecting, you kind of have to enjoy that. The sets are gorgeous. There is good to be found here, but it's a really bad plot. Poison Ivy is still just really bad. I don't care for her at all. I think I made pretty clear in my synopsis what I think of Bad Girl. <laughs> I still don't recommend it. I would not go so far to say, is, oh, no, it's a really good movie, guys. You just have to squint hard. No, it's still a bad movie. It's just there's at least some stuff here that it doesn't anger me the way it used to. So, Melissa, what is your history with this film? And then do you recommend it or not? Well, the first time I saw it, I was dating a man who drew Batman comics. My reaction to it, I believe, was what the all holy fuck is going on for (laughs) the entire running time of two hours and five minutes. It's a mess. It is a glorious, incredibly over-designed mess, but there are some fun things about it. And I will say, this film has also been the subject of one of my favorite movie-watching experiences of my life, because there was one party I had a long time ago where a bunch of people were hanging around at 2 a.m., and I basically put on Batman and Robin, but turned off all the sound, and we just let the iPod put random music over it, and it was awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Because <laughs> everybody at the party, since the sound of the movie was off, nobody got sucked into the movie, but you could occasionally look over there and just go, what the hell? And then kind of absorb it in that fashion. And it was a lot of fun in that way. And then you didn't get sucked into the terrible, terrible <laughs> quips. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice, the ice Age. <laughs> the Iceman cometh. Ah. It's like, well, you know, Eugene O'Neill reference, I appreciate. Yeah. But still. And the fact that he has stacks and stacks of frozen dinners in his lair. (laughs) And the one one that opens the hidden door is the sesame chicken. I know! Mm. I know! It's, oh my god. There are so many dumb jokes in this. At some point, if you just let yourself into it, it eats part of your brain and you can find joy here. (laughs) There is some joy in this movie. And I will say, for as many issues as I have with the depiction of Poison Ivy in this movie, Uma Thurman knows exactly what kind of movie she's in. She's like the secret MVP of this movie. And that's the thing I really latched on when I watched it this morning. It's like, Uma Thurman's really good in this. It's like, she knows exactly what tone this movie is going for, and she is matching it, and she is going for it. And she does a strip tease in a gorilla suit, and that is something <laughs> I can also appreciate. It's like a four-minute musical number. I know. Oh, God. There were so many things wrong with that musical number. Oh, no, I disagree. Oh, God. Okay, we'll get there. I know we'll get there, but I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I know I saw this in theaters because I know I saw all four of the original run of Batman movies in theaters Mm -hmm. with my dad. I remember just not really clicking with it. It wasn't so much the campiness because I grew up on the Adam West series. That Mm -hmm. was my first Mm -hmm. Batman back in the 80s when they would rerun it on the local Fox network. I didn't mind so much the silliness. It just had a hard time getting into it. I think part of it was I was so deep in the animated series at the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. And like, especially Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze was my jam. Yeah. Mr. Freeze in the animated series was one of the best characters that they did. Absolutely. And I'm like, but he's supposed to be emotionless. Why is he wisecracking? Mm. It's just like I had that disconnect. Yeah. This is one that I haven't really revealed visited much i'd occasionally catch snippets of it on tv because this one gets a lot more tv play than forever does mm-hmm. i know i just caught little snippets over here and there but this was the first time i like sat down and rewatched it from beginning to end and i watched it three times oh god in the last month the second time mm-hmm. i actually threw on french without subtitles so i was watching it without the dialogue too. oh boy <laughs> but i still got the music and sound just for curiosity's sake and i recommend it mm-hmm The thing is, I don't think the plot is bad. It's serviceable. It's not trying to do anything too complicated. It's literally one bad guy wants to steal something. Another bad guy wants to steal something. They fight. They team up. The end. And by the way, there's a third bad guy. Also a fourth one that is quickly dispatched. Well, there's a henchman. And Bane's a henchman. 
Um, yeah. let, me just get, let me just get this out. Because I did not recommend Batman Forever. I think my problems mm-hmm. with Batman Forever was it was trying to do more than it was capable of doing. It was trying to be darker and psychological and campy, and it wasn't gelling, and they had to cut out a ton of it. It was just all choppy. And then Kilmer was really flat. I thought this one, they just knew from the ground in what they were doing. Silly, fun, just keep it simple, just keep it serviceable, and then just design the hell out of it. And it's just full of flair. It's full of energy. Even Clooney as Batman has a campy head bob. (laughs) (laughs) That's about all he's got. I want to say the humor comes out more. And even then, there's a couple of genuinely heartfelt moments that I really enjoy, like the Alfred and Bruce stuff, and then with Freeze in the end. I actually just have a fun time doing it. I think it's well shot and edited. I think the action scenes have a lot of good spectacle and flair. The sets and costumes are stunning. I love the music. I think it just has a good flow and a good energy to it. It's big, silly, dumb fun. I think my only thing is just that the dialogue is so one-liner driven Mm -hmm. and lacks wit to go with the dumb one-liner. It it just needed just a little bit more of a bite and a little bit more of a wit. To the point where the line that makes me laugh the most every single time I see it was just an improv line where the two scientists get thawed out (laughs) and then they look up and see the telescope swinging towards them and then one scientist goes, it's one of those days! (laughs) (laughs) It's like, I don't even want to know what the history is behind that, but just go for it. I just it, burst out laughing every time that, I, that line hits. The, the scientists crack me up. I'm like, are you okay down there? Yeah. Dirty and fighter, then- dirty fighter. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, none of those lines were in the script. That I was all on set stuff. I um, love that. I love that stuff. I just wish that the humor had a bit more of a wit to it. Again, like mm-hmm. I mentioned, like if they had brought in Dan Waters, just spice it up a little bit. Yeah. But again, they keep it simple. It works fine enough as it is. It's good energy, good spectacle. I have fun watching it. I recommend it. Like, again, I watched it three times here, and I did not get bored any of those times. The only thing I would say is that I do feel like the stuff with Alfred is way too serious for how campy everything else is. I do feel like that comes off tonally really off compared to everything else. I think they use it as just like a nice little icebreaker between all the shenanigans. An icebreaker of their father uh... dying? <laughs> That's what I mean is to undercut the silliness. I don't know. I disagree. Just to have these little moments to just kind of pull An people down. Icebreaker. And then yes, I know, right? God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even mean that pun. Mm. I, uh... <laughs> no. So... <laughs> Where to start? I mean, let's. My, let's... Michael Gow just looks embarrassed to be there. He's like, yeah. please kill me. And then they revive him. And it's like, oh, no, I mean, please just... let him die. Yeah. <laughs> let's just go ahead and keep on with the threat on Alfred here first. Okay. Mm-hmm. The thing I liked about it was, is you got to genuinely see the connection between him and Bruce. I thought they were flatly staged, but I like the idea of those little bits where Bruce sees him and Alfred in the past. I almost wish they had gone just a little more flatliners, though. like he walks into the memory, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm. I like the idea of him taking Alfred so for granted, because he's always there. Suddenly the threat that Alfred might be gone. I genuinely think Guff does some really nice little performance touch. It's terribly written scenes, but the scene with him and Bruce, where Bruce tells him he loves him, or the scene mm-hmm. with him and Barbara, where she comes to tuck him in. I think they're well played. They're very warm. There's a genuine sweetness to them. I enjoy them. I mean, I don't have a problem with Goff. He's doing great. He's doing fantastic. It's just like George Clooney for like those beginning scenes is playing completely clueless. Like I said, I guess it's supposed to be, oh, I'm not going to let this man look bad. But it's like, no, you look like you don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. And it's like, Alfred is dying. When are one of you fuckers going to say something? Like, that's what I'm sitting there feeling. And then later he's like, oh, well, you know, I knew I just didn't want to. Like, no, you didn't sell it. I'm sorry. Those scenes feel out of place. Yeah. In this movie. I like those scenes on their own, sort of. I mean, they mm-hmm. could be done better, but they don't gel well with the tone of the rest of the film. Yeah. I don't think they're as off-putting as the psychological aspects of Batman Forever. Well, or, yeah, again, I they mean... had to cut out a chunk of it, so... <laughs> That's being yeah. praise. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> but again, I like it because it's soft, and it's just kind of letting the actors play off each other. It's not trying to do anything too overly stylistic or overly thematic. It's just mm-hmm. Alfred's been such the spine holding this whole four-part series together. Having just a little character moment about, you know, we might lose him. What would that mean? I like those scenes. I like them. I just don't think they belong in this movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think part of the issue is both Michael Goff and George Clooney, I feel like neither of their acting styles really blend with this movie either. 
I love Clooney as an actor in general. And I feel for Clooney in this movie, he'd need to turn it up like an extra 10% Mm -hmm. to become another Adam West because Adam West was playing the straight man in the center of the madness too. Right. But, you know, he could rattle off the goofy lines just straight faced and it was awesome. Mm -hmm. And Clooney doesn't quite get that. No. It's not that Clooney doesn't have the skill. He might not have had the skill back then, but I mean, I've seen him do extraordinary comedy stuff since then. He's a Dapper Dan man. Right. Dapper yeah. Dan man, or God, anytime he's with the Coen brothers, it's yeah. genius. Him playing that dumb as rocks actor in Hail Caesar mm-hmm. cracks me up every time. He can do that stuff, but his tone isn't right in this movie. This was like fresh off of ER for him, right? Yeah. 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 This is- and this was the same year as from Dust Till Dawn. Mm-hmm. So he probably hadn't quite grown into the actor we all kind of love comedically now, I think. Well, I know he yeah. was still on ER because I know they had to oh, yeah. do the shooting schedule. Makes they had to sense. incorporate his time on ER. Oh, he was on that show forever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine with him as Batman. I actually yeah, think yeah. he brings a little bit of a swagger. He's got a little bit of a punch to the one-liners that, again, like Kilmer never had. Mm-hmm. Kilmer always struggled with the humor. Yeah. Yeah. But I think Clooney settles into it. I think he's fine as Batman. As Bruce, they're, again, mm-hmm. trying to be a little too cool. Yeah. I like the scene with him and Alfred. But again, like anytime it's a scene between him and Dick, it's just Ugh. like, why is he stealing the kid's haircut now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, or, so or, even, 90s. or even talk about the Alfred bit where someone's knocking at the door and Alfred doesn't show up and they're like, wait, where's Alfred? And then he's like saying to Alfred, well, it's okay. You're allowed to slip once in 37 years. Like, thanks, son. Ha 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 yeah. ha ha. But I mean, like anytime he's Batman, it feels like he's got the energy right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anytime he's in the suit. I'd agree. Clooney is constantly still apologizing for Batman. He okay. considers himself the worst Batman. It's like, it's not true. He's not the problem with this movie. No. <laughs> You know, the commentary, you can tell that Joel's kind of hurt by that. Yeah. Um, but but even Joel is like, you know, on set, he was fun. He was warm. He mm-hmm. was laughing. He was joking. He was a really nice guy to work with. Mm-hmm. They never fought. But obviously, yeah, George does not look back fondly on this experience. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But I mean, he's taking it upon himself. I think it's part of him being self-deprecating. It's like, oh, no, I wasn't good in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and he's always kind of joked about how he's actually written a treatment that he actually tried to sell the Warner Brothers where it's, you know, on page five, Robin dies. And then at their funeral on page 10, Alfred dies. (laughs) It's like, that was just going to set the tone for where we go from here. And it's like, yeah. Well... I think this brings back the ultimate question of, is there still room in this world for a campy Batman? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Deadpool works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Deadpool is still gritty and violent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, Deadpool (laughs) is comedy wrapped in a superhero genre. Yeah. You Mm -hmm. know, I definitely think there's a place for goofiness in superheroes because God knows that we've had 20 billion Marvel movies that all kind of have the same tone that we need some variety. I'm all for it. It's just, I think at the time, people weren't... This was what, 1997? Yeah. Was that the year that Blade came out? That was 98. Okay, because Blade was really the starting point of superhero movies are starting to get traction as Mm -hmm. superhero movies. Right. I think Blade was really the turning point of, yes, this is the start of the formula. If I remember right, Avi Arad was on that one, and he was the one who went on Yeah, he was the one who was selling the properties. Yeah, Mm -hmm. he was the one who first started assembling the Mm -hmm. Marvel properties into some sort of semblance of good... Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, and this was that period where you had the two Burton movies, and then you had that era where nobody could get another superhero movie off the ground, but there were all the pulp heroes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They could get Rocketeer, they could get The Shadow, they could get mm-hmm. The Phantom. Mm-hmm. They were able to get all those off, but they still weren't able to figure out any other superheroes, so Batman was still like the centerpiece of the superhero cinema landscape. Right. And then again, yeah, that kind of marked also the end of that era, mm-hmm. and then Blade started the next era. Yeah. Well, we should also keep in mind in the early and mid 90s, this would have been like right at the edge of it, where where people generally went, oh, I'm so sick of this 80s action movie nonsense. I want stories about actual historical people and dramas and greediness and The indie boom happened. Mm -hmm. You know, studios were throwing stuff at the screens and people weren't going for it anymore. And the the indies, yeah, the the Tarantinos Mm -hmm. of the world caught on and people went, yes, new stuff. This is more interesting now. Mm -hmm. And so Schumacher's Batman movies hit in the middle and tail end of that. And this is absolutely not what audiences were looking for during these years. Yeah. In general, people were trending more towards dark and gritty. And these were Mm -hmm. obviously absolute opposite of that. So, yeah, it was the wrong time for it then. 
whether now would be the right time, you know, that's a whole different thing. But I do think we could eventually bring it back around and make it fun again. Well, I mean, Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. Some of the Marvel movies have managed to toe over into the camp. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, even I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy. Or even stuff like Kick-Ass. And... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think we're at a point now where we've found more of a balance. And I guess yeah. camp is neither good nor bad. It's all about how you do it. Right. Right. Again, like for all those ones that we've mentioned, we also have Suicide Squad, mm-hmm. which is campy as hell and not good. Oh, so <laughs> not good. Yeah. No bueno. <laughs> we'll get to like one of the films that came out of the legacy of this before Batman Begins even came up is the Catwoman movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I finally watched that and prep for this. We can bring it up a little bit more later in the like, end evolved. of the episode. But again, it's like, I think the problem is, yeah, there's nothing underneath the sheen of this movie. I don't think it's doing anything wrong. It's just lacking anything to give any of it weight. Right. Mm. I don't have a problem with the sets and the costumes. Mm -mm. I don't have a problem with the casting. I actually don't have a problem with the plot. It's simple enough. But there's ways in which you could have still thematically dug a little deeper, even if it's just more for comedy and wit. Like, go even further on the ecologist angle. Go even further on the Barbara is against the slavery oppression of the (laughs) butler-dom, you know? Go even further with stuff like that. You know, again, like Dan Waters would have done, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, Batman has a credit card. Okay, what happens if his identity gets stolen and you can't prove that he's Batman and get it fixed? That'd be amazing. You know? <laughs> like that becomes this underlying subplot of the movie where he finds out his car car got stolen. <laughs> I also want to see what OSHA is like in Gotham City mm. because clearly there are so many OSHA violations you see during all of these scenes. <laughs> Missing railings and why are there just big unprotected vats and <laughs> bottles of venom without caps on them. No flame hoods to be well, seen. Well, that wasn't in Gotham. That was in Central America. Oh, that's mm. right. But still, yeah. this whole world needs more OSHA. We're going to build a gigantic observatory on top of the arms of a statue that's looming out over a cliff. Yeah, there's something yeah. about that. And we're going to have an observatory in a city that's known for being so cloudy that we can shine the bat symbol every night. Yep. Mm-hmm. Why would you <laughs> put the world's most advanced <laughs> telescope, quote unquote, in an urban area? <laughs> See, and again, if they had run with that stuff, like just, just run with how absurd it is and just have fun with it. I think that's my biggest thing winning me over on this movie is you can tell the people making it are having fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's got that energy that you always get when everyone involved is legitimately having a good time on set. And even all the behind the scenes footage I saw, everyone's just laughing and having a hoot. And even like the production designers had never done films like this before. Like the production designer, Barbara Lynn, her most recent movie was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. She's never done any other films like this. And she had a blast because this is the only time she ever got to do a film like this. Mm -hmm. You know, and just go nuts with it. I don't have any problem with what's here. I wish that there was a little more depth to it, a little bit more of an underlying thematic relevance to it. Not like in a super serious way, but just something to hold it together. But I'm still fine with this. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. (laughs) (laughs) I think maybe I've just gotten to that point in the Schumacher films where it's like, just you do you, Joel. I kind of want to see what this movie would have been like, you know, take it back to the 60s and give it to Mario Bava. Because I feel like hmm. that would have been Danger Diabolic, except Batman. Well, but those are even just mm-hmm. complete silly nonsense, too. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. But I mean, that's what I'm going for. That's I mean, they is. don't even <laughs> make an effort to give any depth on it. It's all surface gloss, but they work. But I don't think Bava would have done anything super different with it, though. It would probably just be this. It's got all the yeah. light gels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> all my God. The light gels. Whoever lit this movie <laughs> clearly had just discovered the water ripply reflection of effect because it's everywhere even (laughs) without water involved water ripply effect everywhere wow that makes me wonder because thinking even back at that time you know because we had the burton films Mm -hmm. the batman the animated series had been on for like five years at this point Mm because wasn't that 92 that that debuted that sounds right yeah that sounds right culturally we had settled on this is batman like speaking of bane we had nightfall Mm -hmm. that entire comic arc that redefined the book for a while We culturally were in a certain place with Batman, and I think this was not at all where that culture was. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Batman Forever worked better with audiences because not all that had settled in yet, Mm -hmm. even though that was only just two years prior. Right. And I think this one does take it further, too. Yeah. Oh, goodness, yeah. So, you know, it's also a matter of degrees. Of Do I want to watch Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey, which I've obviously been doing for quite a few movies now? <laughs> or do I want to watch Arnold make a bunch of ice puns mm. <laughs> constantly? You know what I mean? It's a little bit of a difference there. Let's go ahead and shift into the villains. Angie, what do you think about Arnold as Mr. Freeze? Well, like I said, he's having the time of his life. <laughs> You do have to step away from what you know of the animated series. He's not that villain, for sure. He's not the visibly designed by Mike Mignola version. (laughs) Oh, yeah. 
yeah, like I said, I used to hate him. I used to be like, what is this? This is way too goofy. I can't. But now I'm just kind of like, you know what? He's having a good time. Good for him. He got paid like $15 million and got top billed. Yeah, and, and, and he billing. got lights on his butt. <laughs> Did you notice on yes. the suit, he has lights, one on each butt cheek. By the way, he's only in- There's so many butts in this movie. He's only in five minutes of the movie and the rest of it's all the double that he's doing ADR over. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I didn't realize that. <laughs> anytime you can visibly see his face. Well, actually, only half the time. Anytime it's a wide shot and you see his face, that's the double. God. I let the credits run. He had a drama coach. <laughs> It's for that scene where he steps wow. out of the freeze ray. Yeah. When he has the tears come down, I guess. I yeah, don't know. Well, those it's tears like... were definitely CGI. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, oh, he had a drama coach for this. Oh, a good job. Oh. <laughs> Melissa, what are your thoughts on Arnie? <laughs> you know what? I have a hard time hating Arnie right now. I actually just watched a thing with him the other night on YouTube. Guys, it James Corden that has the talk show with mm. Spill Your Guts yep. or Fill Your Guts? He did it with Arnold, and it's hilarious. I highly recommend it. But this era, Arnold, I feel like we were still trying to figure out what to do with him that wasn't quippy. <laughs> and he was perfectly happy just being quippy. So he seems to be happy with it. I can't rag on him too much. He is another person who mostly understands the tone of the movie that he's in. So I can give him that. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about Arnold is you look at like his early stuff, like Conan and Terminator, and the biggest thing that's holding him back is he hasn't learned how to emote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just very flat face. I mean, he's got the voice and the accent and everything, but he's just very flat faced. And then as you're getting into the late 80s, into the early 90s, you're starting to see him start to express more. And then he started to get the comedies like Kindergarten yeah. Cop and mm -hmm. Twins. What was the one where he was pregnant? <laughs> Junior. Mm. Junior, where he's Oof. even in drag, telling, where's Larry? Give me my Larry. <laughs> You know, and jingle um, all the way. And it's like, by the time you get to this movie, this is a pure emotive performance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just so expressive and so over the top. And yet it works. It really works. The one-liners, you could cut out half of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. But, you know, it's one of those ones where, it's, again, if you just roll with it, if you just go with what the actor's doing, mm -hmm. like, go back to the Adam West series. It's like, just roll with it. Victor you know? Bono and... No, he was King Tut. Oh, he was King Tut. Who was Mr. Freeze? It was Predinger. Oh, yeah. Otto Preminger. Otto Preminger. They actually had three different guys play Mr. Freeze. He appeared three Ooh, different yes. times, and it was three different actors every time. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. I think Otto was the one that I watched... He says wild over and over again. He doesn't really do many ice puns mm -hmm. for most of his performance. He just, for some reason, he always says like, oh, this is really wild. He's doing this really, <laughs> I guess it's supposed to be a German accent. Well, that's Otto. Yeah. yeah. And the plot of the two-parter that I watched was he kidnapped Miss Iceland and he was slowly getting her body temperature down. And supposedly once it got to the same temperature as his, she would fall in love with him. She was not interested. And then he also had this whole plot where he was framing Batman to look like a bad guy who was accepting bribes because Batman was responsible for his condition. Mm. The best part of that, talking about Adam West, and I'm probably not going to be able to do him service. I wrote it down because it was <laughs> so good. So he's ruining Batman's reputation and Batman doesn't save people because they puts his henchmen in bat suits to do a bad job and stuff. And this little boy sees a picture of Batman and Robin in a window and he goes, boo, Batman. They see this and Adam West in this totally straight face goes, no blow from a villain has ever hurt me more than that little boy's boo. <laughs> and it's just, it was so fantastic of like that man. Oh, he was such a talent. I guess that's like the main thing is like watching them back to back is that Mr. Freeze was so much more low key than yeah, Arnold's yeah. version. You know, it's quite, quite a difference. And especially when you look at the Batman animated series. Oh, yeah. Mr. Freeze. Wow. Which was iconic. And again, like. Right. It's so good. The whole wife but it's also story and all that. That came all came from, from the animated yeah. series. Yeah. And that particular character is not grandiose. It's very mm. full of Cold. gravitas. Cold. Yes. Hey, Understated. Hey. That's literally what they used to define the characterization. I know. He's cold. I know. Yeah. And that was always my biggest thing as a kid. It's like, but he's supposed to be emotionless. Why is he laughing? <laughs> I mean, I think. Because he's having fun, Noel. The biggest dissonance. Winter is fun, Noel. The thing is, I absolutely love it now. Yeah. But my biggest dissonance with the Freeze character when I saw this is when I was younger mm -hmm. was the bit where you come to the snow cone headquarters and you push in and here's Mr. Freeze in a robe and fuzzy slippers mm -hmm. conducting his 
his henchmen to sing the Snow Miser song. Yes. Right. <laughs> and Arnie's has a cigar. Why would Mr. Freeze even smoke a cigar? Yeah, it's a white cigar, I know. so it's okay. <laughs> oh, it's Freezer Burn. Oh, God. <laughs> I do love that this movie gives us that moment of, I hate when people talk during the movie. Yes. Because you can just clip that out, play it in front of movies, yeah. in the movie theater, tell people to shut up, and you're good. I love just how absurd that sequence gets, where it's Mr. Freeze doing all that stuff, and his mm. henchmen are trying to lick frozen dinners, yes. like, they're, like they're popsicles, <laughs> while they're <laughs> suffering. They're just in misery. Mm -hmm. And then Vivica A. Fox is trying to- Why is she even there? <laughs> Because she was visiting the set one day and Joel threw her in. <laughs> that is a hell of a costume to just have on hand. Do you know what her name is, by the way? What? Miss B. Haven. <laughs> <sighs> that, that should be like a sidekick to Poison Ivy. The B. Haven would be a more of an yeah. ecological thing. That'd be kind of amazing, yeah. really. I, and I'd support yeah. Vivica Fox. Again, it's like Drew Barrymore in the last movie. Yeah. It's literally Drew Barrymore had a few days between her schedule and Joel was like, hey, you want to come to set? It'll be fun. You know, and they were friends. <laughs> they were friends. And, and him and Vivica Fox were friends. And, but see, that you know. makes more sense, yeah. kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, I, I, it, why would he even have a mall? Why would he? trying to seduce him. <laughs> <laughs> why? Yes, I wrote in my notes, why is there an icy tart in the room when he's beloved of his wife? Why? Mm -hmm. Why, 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 why? To establish that he's beloved of his wife. Yep. <sighs> <laughs> so why is she there? Why? She's hoping for something different. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's nonsensical. And again, it's one of those things I would just be like, turn into it you know just roll into it just yeah. it makes no sense just keep going go even further with it you know mm -hmm. why would you be wearing something that is very forward on these stockings and garters in a room that cold in a transparent coat in a transparent coat yeah because <sighs> but again it's one of those things it's like i enjoy it, it, it it's it's <laughs> so sure absurd you do, it's so absurd that i just <laughs> and everyone's having fun that i just roll with it <laughs> But again, it's like, yeah, her character never appears again. Nope. Mm -hmm. There's no broader reason for why she's there. Nope. I agree, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I even love how they build on that with Poison Ivy tries to blow him with the dust. And he's like, mm. oh, pheromone spray. I like that. Don't work on me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> why does he recognize it? He knows the smell of pheromones, I guess. Because <laughs> he's a science man. <laughs> yeah. How do his nostrils work when you're frozen? <laughs> I don't know. You can't smell anything when it's really cold outside. I know, right? Your nose hairs freeze together and it's awful. Well, and obviously his hair has all frozen off. Right. Visibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, that'd be cold. You'd get like freezer burn headaches. I know, right? Breathing. Oh, what if that's the entire reason why he has such a sour personality is he just has a constant never-ending popsicle head? <laughs> That and having those light up capsules in your mouth that light up your teeth. They the dyed his teeth blue, and then there's a little light on the outside of his mask that's shining. Uh, as, yeah. It's a black light okay. that's shining at his mouth. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just going with it because it's so over the top and silly. <laughs> <laughs> why are there so many lights on his suit? Because the lights would heat up. Oh, and they did. That's why Arnie didn't do much shooting in that suit. <laughs> There's special LED lights yeah. that don't give off heat. It's fine. There was one day where a battery started leaking acid into his mouth, too. Oh, my oh God. God. <laughs> they had to very quickly fix that. Wow. It's odd because I don't always enjoy movies that are just this silly. Like, I have a hard time revisiting Dick Tracy. Mm, like, Dick yeah. Tracy, it's kind of all over the place. And this one, yeah. I think also it's just the plot is so simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you say that it's complex and full of stuff, but it's very simple. Establish one villain, establish the other villain. They clash, then they part, then they team up. And then they decide to destroy the city and you got to stop them. It's a very and there's simple Bane. plot. But again, he's just mm -hmm. henchman. He's just muscle. He doesn't have a story. <sighs> Poor Bane. It's not that the plot is complex. It's more that just so much stuff happens, but there's so little yeah. consequence to it, I guess. Yeah. That it makes it hard to recap for sure. Yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> By the way, one of my other favorite comedy bits is where his gun is stuck up on a ledge. So he just oh. grabs a guard and throws the yeah. guy up yeah. to knock it off. Yeah. And then turns around and the guard falls. Back. It's the stupidest joke. I also like that one of the Arkham guards is Jesse Ventura. Oh, Jesse Ventura and Ralph Muller. And yes. Yes. <laughs> but you have a little bit of governor versus governor action going on yeah. there. So he got to bring in two of his friends who got to kiss Uma Thurman. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> yeah. No, and that was fun that they got those two as guards, even though they're visibly dubbing over Ralph Muller's voice because he sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. <laughs> so Poison Ivy. I don't like her. Well, that's fair. 
I don't think she's well written. I feel like they were trying to evoke some traces of Catwoman, like with the feminism comments, but obviously not quite as, it's more environmentalism, but she just doesn't work. And it's like, if this is supposed to be a kid's movie, why is she making so much blatant sexual innuendo? Mm-hmm. I mean, like the striptease is funny, right? Because she's dressed as a gorilla. But when she's up there, like talking to Batman and Robin, and I'm like, this is icky. This is not stuff for children's ears. This is a bit much. Like, who is this movie supposed to be for? Is it supposed to be for people who grew up in the 60s and they're like, oh, yeah, I remember when it was like this? Or is it supposed to be for children now? And I feel like her plot in particular really clashes with that. Like, Freeze is just full on goofy, but she's like trying to be like a little more serious with her camp and it just clashes for me. And I just, I don't know, I'm not as into her stuff as I am into Frieza's stuff. I think as a kid, it helped that I had seen Mae West movies. Yeah. And thought they mm-hmm. were hilarious. She's very much Mae West Marlene Dietrich. Yeah. Especially since the whole gorilla thing, that is a reference to Blind Venus, which is an old Marlene Dietrich movie. It plays exactly the same. You have white people doing, quote, native dance, and then suddenly this person in a gorilla suit comes out and strip teases, and it's Marlene and Dietrich with a giant blonde freight wig and arrows stabbed through her hair, singing... And a saxophone going... <laughs> and it, what she sing? Hot voodoo? Yeah. Yeah. That entire dance sequence is a reference to a different movie. Mm. Definitely during that whole scene, she is doing Mae West, Marlena Dietrich sort of thing. Yeah. And I'm... Especially I, the walking across the men. Walking, um, walking yeah. across the men, the whole thing. Yeah. That dance is so wrong, but I appreciate a reference to Blonde Venus. <laughs> like I said earlier, I really like what Uma Thurman herself is doing with what she was given. I think she has the tone nailed, but yeah, you're right. Who is this movie for? I don't know. I just like watching Uma Thurman. I do question why her outfits seem to get less interesting as the movie goes on. Because she hits upon like the scaled swimsuit thing Mm -hmm. and the red hair and the vines all over. It's like, that's Pequois and Ivy. And then she kind of goes the Catwoman thing with the cat suits and the belts and stuff. It's like, eh, not so much. I actually noticed the progression of the outfits in this movie. And they said that Uma Thurman actually co-designed her outfits and her wigs in this movie. Her hair kept getting bigger. No, and that's the thing. It was weird. That's the thing I noticed is when she first appears as Poison Ivy, and then even during the... There's a Turkish bathhouse in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. And it's painted in fluorescent lighting and black light. But I mean, the thing is, you'll see that she starts and she's got these two kind of little braided buns on the top of her head. Mm -hmm. And then midway through the movie, it's these conical things that are like unblossomed flowers. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the movie, they've bloomed and are now all over the place. (laughs) And even her outfit, yeah, it goes from the leaves to mm-hmm. then the solid green mm-hmm. of like a stem. Mm-hmm. And then in the end, it's bloomed into a reddish orange. Okay. I kind of like the ombre thing that was happening yeah. on the final the red outfit. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. it fades to black for the bottom. But still, I wasn't big on it. I wish they had kept the leaf pattern instead of just the solid cat suit. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I like the colors. Not so much the weird pink fingertips, because that was a little too Yeah, that was me. weird. That was a little too cat Yeah, you, you have like mm-hmm. the sort of rubber gloves that yeah. you do kitchen work in. Oh, yeah, the tips. Which she was wearing in the lab when she got exposed. Mm-hmm. I know. But, but I don't think no. that's something you need to tie. No. No. I don't really find the sexuality and the innuendo to be inappropriate because it's that type of thing that would have flown over the kids' heads, even as the kids are just kind of appreciating the camp of it. Again, if you think back to, like, the Catwoman of the 60s series. Oh, yeah. That was super sexual and tons of innuendo. Mm -hmm. And they got away with it. And because kids, they didn't really get that meaning behind it, but they appreciated the campiness of it. And then when you see it when you're older, it's like, oh, hey, (laughs) hello, Julie Newmar. Yes. (laughs) Lee Merriweather. Yeah. And we're forgetting Eartha Kitt. Eartha Kitt. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Makes me so happy. (laughs) The biggest thing that I have, and this goes back to what we had in Batman Forever with the Riddler and Two-Face, is the villain who has the most character-defining and interesting origin Mm -hmm. has that origin take place off-camera and it's already happened in the past. Yeah. Right. And the villain who is not defined by their origin, but rather their aesthetic choices, like the Riddler and like Poison Ivy, Mm -hmm. are the ones who are given the detailed origin. Right. Yeah. That I do agree is that's bad storytelling. Mm -hmm. Because again, like Harvey Dent showed all, all about his character journey and his origin. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And it's not. It's all about the Riddler. Right. Who's not really a character. He's just a gimmick. Yeah. yeah. And Poison Ivy is more a gimmick. And I always thought, even since I was a kid, what would have just made this better is, okay, she's an eco-terrorist. She's the one who attacks the lab and causes the accident that does what it does to Freeze and his wife. Right. Mm. And then he wants to get revenge on her. Mm -hmm. You know, that would have just been a much easier setup. Yeah. Yeah. That said, something I do appreciate about this movie that I noticed this time watching it is this movie drops you right in the center of the action. It's like, (laughs) fuck you, explanations. We're just going to drop you right into a fight scene. Hey, there's this guy named Mr. Freeze attacking the museum. And you're here. It's literally, we get suiting up montage. Yeah. Chicks dig the car. Mm -hmm. And then Commissioner Gordon calling in with his update. Yeah. Yeah. And then boom. Speaking of which, the reason why they have ice skates, my belief, is Mm -hmm. they get their update from Commissioner Gordon so they know what tools to bring and their vehicles suit them up. Okay. (laughs) Why not? It's like, freezing villain. Okay, let's select the winter gear. (laughs) I mean, I think if you just take that museum scene by itself, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a lot of the rest of the movie where things kind of start to go wrong for me, but that beginning scene is pretty fun. I have a question. What kind of museum is that? Little of everything. (laughs) Little of everything. And I love how far (laughs) just the museum's frozen, the guards are frozen, everyone's ice skating, everyone has hockey sticks, Mm -hmm. the giant dinosaur is falling over, stealing the diamond. And now his vehicle becomes a rocket ship. Yeah. <laughs> and then they go up in the rocket ship and then they're surfing. Their- <laughs> oh, yeah. my God. I read the credits this time and there's something hysterical in the credits that I saw. Rick Baker did the Frozen Cops and a couple other things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The legendary Rick Baker. Yeah, he provided the dummies. Yeah. Okay. It's credited in the credits as Principal Copsicles. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> Popsicles. <laughs> Principal popsicles. popsicles. <laughs> I mean, speaking of, I do love Freeze's makeup. How it's got that glittery pattern to it. Yeah. Like oh, yeah. Diamond dust almost. Yeah. 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 I'm friends with the guy who designed his makeup for Ooh. this movie, Chris Ballas. Ooh. Yeah. He's a local. Several years ago at Convergence, he was attending and he brought his life-size model of Arnold's head with all the makeup prep on it. It's like seeing it up close is really impressive. Nice. Yeah. Honestly, this film doesn't fall apart for me after that sequence. Like, I love the whole motorcycle chase scene. I love the Turkish bass where it's, again, just a generic black light gang Mm -hmm. who's there for like two minutes. Just like the black light gang from Batman Forever, just different colors. Yep. I wish it was the same gang. I know. (laughs) What's funny is like Frosty, the principal henchman of Freeze, is the same actor slash stuntman who played the principal henchman of Two-Face. Yeah. Okay. I just want to believe that that's the same character. And he just kind of like happily- Yeah, he needed a new job. I'm pretty sure there was an episode of the animated series that was that, of just a guy who just perpetually gets jobs as henchmen. Oh, there was once upon a time a pitch that never went anywhere that was a concept for a comic book about all the henchmen in Gotham, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and just following their storylines, it's like, oh man, I can't work for the Riddler anymore. <laughs> you know, what do we got? You know, look at the want ads, the villain want ads. <laughs> so steering things back to Poison Ivy, I think one of my other issues with her is while I love everything that's there, again, speaking of going further, it's like I wish they had done more with the plant-animal hybrid yeah. Mm. Like, I mean, where's the giant Venus flytrap T-Rex? You know? <laughs> Why isn't Audrey 2 singing? <laughs> exactly. That's what I want to know. Yeah. I mean, it's like, really, all we got were some vines and then her big blooming chair, which then closes on her for some reason. Yeah, yeah I which didn't makes no get sense. that. Yeah. It's like, we ran out of ideas. We shall dispatch with the woman. <laughs> and to me, too, I don't understand why she wants Freeze so bad that she's got to kill his wife. It's such a bad yeah. female yeah. jealousy trope and a Up to that point, she's pretty clearly not interested in people. She's interested in plants. He's not Mm -hmm. a plant. So why does she want him so bad that she has to kill his wife or try to? Right. I think her entire thing is all about using her allure to control people. Mm -hmm. Her reason for wanting freeze is because by freezing all life on Earth, then we can just wipe the slate clean and then I can raise the plants out of that. Yeah. But still. It's simple. But again, I wish (laughs) it was more they were at odds and she Mm -hmm. caused the accident. She's also a scientist. Yes. Why didn't she offer freeze? She'd help him find a cure for his wife and also will just wipe out humanity. Ooh, Mm -hmm. ooh, a Venus flytrap polar bear hybrid. I could get behind that. Evil plant penguins. (laughs) Okay. Wrong villain. That's already been done. Uh, (laughs) Evil plant seals. Hmm. You know, they have leaves and they're just going like... You know, (laughs) you you tricked the dogs. That was the wrong thing to do. Yeah, don't, don't. (laughs) As mayhem erupts upstairs. (laughs) So while we wait for the dogs to settle, Angie, what did you think of Chris O'Donnell as Robin? 
uh, I really don't like him in this movie. It's not necessarily his performance. It's more what they've written for him. He just comes off so whiny of like, you can't handle the fact that she likes me. And it's like they took elements from the comics of Dick Grayson, you know, getting older, wanting to kind of do his own thing, not just live under Batman's shadow. But they framed it so much under this Poison Ivy plot that it really just loses any real depth and he just comes off as a whiny idiot that's being manipulated by these pheromones. It's like they're trying to sort of build some chemistry between him and Batgirl, but it's mostly just by the fact that they end up doing stuff together, not that they really interact in any kind of meaningful way. So I'm not really buying into that either. I imagine they're trying to maybe save that for a sequel where they'd fall in love or something. But as a Dick Grayson fan, the whole thing is just very, very disappointing for me. I find him to be relentlessly boring as an actor. <laughs> Not like he's given much to do either, except be whiny, but oh my god, he's so flat. He's just so flat. There's no real life in that character at all. Again, I really liked him in Batman Forever. Mm -hmm. I thought his arc was well put together. Yeah. I like Chris O'Donnell in the part. I think he does a good job of gelling with the tone. But again, yeah, just the way the character is written in this one, it's mm -hmm. not as compelling. The Goldsman dialogue of, you yeah. know, she wanted me and not you. Yeah. When do I get a car? Yeah. What more effectively said things in their relationship were the visuals of, one, him getting thrown into melted ice cream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, why, why was that vat even there? And as much as I hate the whole chase scene along the statue's arm, mm -hmm. where Bruce kills the engine of his motorcycle and prevents him from doing a jump, yeah. I do like that shot of the angry Robin shouting after Batman. It's like, that's the moment Nightwing should be born. Mm. And to be fair, I'm pretty sure that shot was the entire pitch for the Titans TV series. <laughs> fair. <laughs> That I like. That's what I've heard. Which, that TV series, the head writer is a Kimmy Goldsman. Mm. You know, I wonder what would have happened if Robin was like 15 years old in this movie. Yeah. With the exact same dialogue. That may have actually worked better. Edward yet. Furlong is Robin. <laughs> oh boy. No. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Snotty little brat. <laughs> yes. Mm. I'm fine with there being the tension there. It's just not well written tension. It's trying to give a dramatic undercurrent that's not selling. Yeah. I like, again, moments where, like, they're in full costume and they're just playing off each other. Like, as stupid as it is, it's the whole, like, one million, two million, you don't have two million, I'll borrow it from you, three million. Yeah. That was fun. The back credit card. Mm. I see from your Oof. notes you had something about the credit card. Yes. <laughs> there are so many of my notes. It's like, oh, my God, why? <laughs> That invite for the ball. Oh, yeah. What was going on with Who that? Who the fuck designed that? What the hell is going on? Hell. Hell is what's going on on that invite. <laughs> <laughs> what about that invite relays anything about what that ball is supposed to be about? Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Again, my only problem is that this film just doesn't go further. I mean, I think you either go further or you dial it back. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I could be happy with it either way. It's a harder story. I mean, like, Batman Forever had a story that you could retool as something more darker and dramatic. Yeah. 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 This one, it's a little harder. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just such a simpler story. Again, you could get a dark, dramatic story out of Ivy versus Mr. Freeze, but you'd have to just scrap everything and start over from the base up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is one where, again, I would just bring in a really sharp comedy writer, take what's there and just push it further and push it sharper. Yeah. yeah. Really get some punch to the jokes, actually have some better built character bits. Again, Dan Waters. I'm never going to stop saying Dan Waters' name because he wrote one, right. two films ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> again, his Catwoman script, if Joel had done that, gold. <laughs> Well, I don't know if it would have sold well, but it would have been fabulous to watch. <laughs> no, it wouldn't have. But again, like, again, I just showed our friend Sean Demolition Man for the first time. And it's like, that film didn't sell, but boy, do people love it now. Yeah. Oh my God, Demolition Man is gold. It bombed then, but it's one of those ones where it's like, it's worth letting it just so it exists. Yeah. It needed that bite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The humor in this movie has no bite. No, yeah. it doesn't. It's very ice cream, cotton candy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, again, is fine. I still enjoy what's here. I just wish that there was more to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm fine with the nipples. I don't care about the nipples. Just run with the nipples. Make them neon. Light them up, you know? <laughs> the gorilla suit had nipples. I, mean, I noticed that this The time. only thing about the defined butt is that it doesn't have a defined butt hole, you know? <laughs> oh, my God. 
like, has he ever said why he chose to do that? It was just looking at classical statues and like yeah. medieval Roman armor. It's okay. all about abs and muscular definition and they had the nipples. All right. They don't add anything other than giving everyone something to comment on. <laughs> well, they, they add something you can catch on something if, yeah. if you're in the midst of a fight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, I would have made a comedy bit about like Robin getting a nipple twerk or something. <laughs> Ow. Like maybe there's just like a little extra piece of armor right over the nipples so they don't or get they're, they're like a sensory device. <laughs> they're like Dalek yeah, bumps. It's like activate your bat sonar and it's like the nipples <laughs> light up. They're like pulsing. <laughs> that, like a little antenna comes up. Yeah. Again, it's like the nipples are silly enough. Just make them sillier. Was that Ren and Stimpy? Probably. <laughs> no. No, I think it's actually Rocco's Modern Life. Oh, right. oh that could where be. Where the yeah. super hero literally does have like nipples through which you can see the future and he like pulls his nipples out and shoves it into the character's eye holes that well, sounds very john crick to me yeah. yeah one of the bits that i loved in the new tick series that they just did was they have a doctor strange character uh -huh. who has a third nipple yes that's that's the, <laughs> that's the source of his magical power yeah. and it's like an all-seeing eye in the middle of his chest and it's just a third nipple <laughs> And literally, like, through that, he can warp the reality of time and space. Oh, that's perfect. I love it. <laughs> the new Tick series is great. Yeah. Camp I, need two I need to watch it. I need to watch it. Yeah. I love the Tick. Again, it's like, the nipples on their own, I don't care, because, like, amidst everything that's going on in these movies, they fit that aesthetic. Just that design, that tone, and all that. It fits. And that's why I think people reference it, because if you don't like this aesthetic, that's the exclamation point on it, of like, he even put nipples on the bat suit. That's the literal yes. point. The nipple is the point. Yes. <laughs> that sensitive little point. <laughs> Yeah, like, nobody would give a shit about the like, nipple suit. What if zip. Batman used it as a glass cutter? No. No, <laughs> no. No. <laughs> 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 what we're talking about is that's the type of movie that I think we all would have enjoyed more mm -hmm. had it been even broader and goofier and more absurd. Yes. Yeah. If they had gone even further, I think that would have been more effective overall Yeah, mm -hmm. because everyone would then get the joke. Right. Or if this had come out, well, it still would need work, but if this had come out five, ten years later, it would have been a very different reception, I think. Because once you get into the more superhero era of the 2000s, that's when audiences are starting to look for material yeah. like this again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they would be more perked up by the nipples. I don't know about that. <laughs> Maybe. Mm -hmm. No, probably not. <laughs> but again, what's worked for the campy films now with like Deadpool, Thor, Ragnarok, mm -hmm. other stuff like that, Guardians, is they're sharper and they're smarter. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, Much smarter. And whenever they do a dumb joke, they usually acknowledge that was a dumb joke. Yeah. This is just all dumb jokes. Yeah. Well, and I would also say that's what makes the 60s show work as well, is that it's smarter and it knows what it yeah. is and it's just mm -hmm. better at it than this is. Well, I mean, the head writers of that show were the guy who wrote... I'm not saying every episode is perfect. <laughs> who wrote Crawl and Ice Pirates. <laughs> and then the other one wrote Sheena. Okay. Yeah. yeah Lorenzo Semple Jr. wrote Sheena and yeah. then the Kong movie of the 70s. Oh, the... 70s uh, King Kong. The Dino De Laurentiis yeah. one. Yeah. Any thoughts, Angie, about Bane? See, and this is another one where I know every version is different, but Bane is such a complex character. He's very intelligent in mm -hmm. other iterations. And mm -hmm. to strip him down to just this one word hulking guy, it's really disappointing because, like you said, you know, Nightfall was not that long ago. And to immediately go ahead and take this character and turn him into such a joke is kind of, I don't know, it just bothers me. In the movie itself, it's hard to really say anything about him other than that he's very goofy, because he's obviously not doing much. And I oddly feel sad for him. I love him in the trench coat and fedora. <laughs> <laughs> Why is he even there? <laughs> I mean, that's... To break through walls. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there are other ways to break through walls. <laughs> and if you have an outfit like that, if all of your strength comes from the goo that is flowing through you, why would the hoses be so exposed? <laughs> you could just yank those things out, clearly. And why? Yeah. I mean, why? It would have been perfectly fine to have Killer Croc and just have him be like, you know, the plant-animal-human hybrid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that she's experimenting on. Yeah. That'd be so much cleaner. I think Bane was just a bigger name at the time. Right. Yeah. No, he wasn't. 
<laughs> no, I mean, he was pop in, in terms of Batman yeah, lore. Yes. Yeah. He was very talked about because that whole Nightfall thing was right. in 94. Four. Oh, I suppose. So it was mm-hmm. pretty recent. Yeah. And he was a popular character at the time. And I want to say around the same time as when they premiered the animated series episode of him. And yeah. I remember that being a big deal. They were like, yeah. Bane's yeah. going to be in this episode. Yeah. Bane! Yeah. And what's odd is in Dark Knight Rises, a lot of his backstory that they use for that is actually from Killer Croc's first appearance in the comics. Yeah. Because hmm. okay. Killer Croc actually was a complicated character in the 70s when he was debuted in the comics. Because mm-hmm. he was literally coming to Gotham and systematically dismantling the entire underworld and turning the city into chaos. Bane, as a character, is very much a redo of what Killer Croc used to be mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. before Killer Croc just became Killer Croc. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting how there's always been this weird relationship between the two. But yeah, I think Bane, there's no reason for this character to be Bane. I'm fine with her having a muscular henchman who speaks in single words. Mm-hmm. Again, I thought it was funny when he's like, monkey work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that he's driving the car in his fedora and trench. Yeah, why didn't she yeah. just have a plant golem, you know? Yeah. Right. Say, monkey work. Yeah. Exactly. Like, literally a Venus flytrap walking around in a fedora and trench coat. Yes! Oh my god, I'd be so into that. I know, right? I really yeah. would be. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Like, what if it was Killer Croc, but he had, like, the Venus flytrap split down the middle of his head? Uh-huh. You know, kind of like the creature in Stranger Things? Mm. And just walking around the city like that, but because he's got a fedora on, everyone just accepts it. <laughs> or like those yeah. freaky vampires from, what was it, Blade 3? That had yeah. the Blah! The predator yeah. mouths? Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't do at least a shot of him holding Batman up like the I will break you. Oh, yeah, that would have been awesome. But poor Bane. Yeah. No Mm -hmm. love for Bane in this movie. No. Can I do one thing real quick? Go for it. Since we're talking about all the villains, the Dr. Jason character is played by John Glover. Yes. Who was the voice of the Riddler in the animated series. That had to have been a shout out. Well, it's also Joel that worked with John Glover. He was the villain in Incredible Shrinking Woman. Right, yeah. right. Also, yay, John Glover. Mm-hmm. And also the character is actually the Floronic Man. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. He has a, from the I didn't comics. realize that. Because Joel actually cut. does know his stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, apparently Joel actually talked about how he actually wished that he had gotten on one of the Swamp Thing movies. Because mm-hmm. he okay. loved the Swamp Thing comic. <laughs> Imagine Joel Schumacher's Swamp Thing. Oh, my God. And it's all, like, autumn tones. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, I would love to have seen that. That would have been a thing to behold. Yeah. So, Melissa. Barbara. Batgirl. <laughs> Talking about Barbara. Whew. They tried. Uh, <laughs> Alicia Silverstone is fine. I don't think she understands what movie she's in either. <laughs> But I don't blame her. (laughs) I think she does. It's just outside of her range. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the movie doesn't give service to that character at all. Part of it's the writing. Like, Batgirl's an afterthought. There was just not that much there. I'm not sure why they made her a relative of Alfred rather than Gordon, but that's fine. You know, whatever. Because the plot's about Alfred and Gordon. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, clearly Gordon's barely there. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't this have been a great time to showcase Bat Angle? Yes. Yes, it would have been a great opportunity to do so. But I do like that Batgirl brings up the master and servant angle. It's like, yeah, you're right. You're right. You tell them. Okay, good. (laughs) But (laughs) like the feminism of that character is so ham handed. It's hard to watch. (laughs) No, I've got you. Uh, Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I agree. Like, I know Alicia Silverstone can act. She's fantastic Mm -hmm. and clueless. Yeah. It's probably that there wasn't much on the page here because she mostly just bites her lip and gets pouty every now and then. Yeah. Like I said, that's what I'm thinking. Like, this is where you're trying to present a strong female character, but you don't know how to actually write a woman. So (laughs) you just kind of like, well, she's really smart and she's tough. Uh, Yes, but let's make her a person too. Maybe, you know, like she can have interest and like, yeah, the problem with the master servant line is that it comes out of nowhere and then Mm -hmm. nothing else ever happens of it again. Right. So it just comes off really weird and like, oh, we're going to talk about that now. Oh, but now we're okay. Now it's done. All right. Now it's just back to father son (laughs) stuff. Okay, cool. Whether it was an afterthought that somebody was like, we should have Batgirl in this movie, put her in there, or what? Like, it's just not a good job with the character at all. No. 
I wish that they had kept going on with like a perfect counterpoint to that would be like, but Alfred's like a father to us. Yes, because you pay him. I think the counterpoint to that would be, yeah, but he has full control to all the estates and funds and basically Mm -hmm. pays himself whatever he wants. And in fact, he even created an entire wing of the house for his model carriage collection. You know, (laughs) (laughs) he is part of the family. He presents himself as a butler, but he's still part of the family. Right. Still, we're talking about a movie this campy and then suddenly classism. Right. Yeah. For and about and 30 again, it's, seconds. It's something and that's that you it. could have even gone further into. That's oh, what yeah. I wish they had. Mm-hmm. Alfred is still getting into things like, civilized man doesn't speak about his ailments. I thought I taught you better than that. <laughs> it's like, to your own family, you tell them if you're dying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why they wanted the Batgirl character. I understand that they had a story that was already about Bruce and Alfred. But they're falling into that trap of what they're currently doing with DC, where it's like, Steel was a great popular character, but we're embarrassed of the Shaquille O'Neal movie, so we got to get rid of Steel. Let's put Cyborg in his place because it's another shiny black man. Mm -hmm. But they're different characters. Yeah. (laughs) Steel was popular because he was a cool character. Mm -hmm. You can't just fill that void by putting another black man in chrome. This is not Batgirl, the character. This is just another character. Yeah. At some point, there's also not enough room in the movie for three heroes and three villains yeah. and mm-hmm. Alfred and... You there, could have there's fully a lot going on. Yeah. Because yeah. everything she does in the movie, you could have had like, okay, illegal street bike racing is Robin going off to off steam because he's angry at fighting with Bruce. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and he ends up losing the bike that he spent all this time fixing because he's reckless. And that's mm-hmm. where he realizes that he's reckless and reinvigorates himself. Yeah. You know, the whole fight with Poison Ivy, Poison Ivy and Robin are the ones that have the dynamic that needs to be resolved by him conquering Poison Ivy. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead, we fall into that typical thing of like, oh, well, the girl's got to fight the girl. We got to have a girl fight the girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, and Poison Ivy's physical menace is so defined by Bane. If you just made it, Mm -hmm. Robin has to get through Bane. Right. And then she no longer has that muscle to wield. It's still a bad analogy. Mm -hmm. And then you could have had Bane like lift Robin over, like break, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You could literally pull Batgirl out of this entire story. Yeah. And it would still function. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. And same with Bane. Well, but again, Bane doesn't take up any more room. He's just muscle for the bad guy. I know, yeah. but the, I mean, why Why bother? Anyway. <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, it's like, like Batgirl. If you're going to give that little service I, to it, why bother? I don't mind Bane because he's the monkey with a fez in Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Now I want a monkey and a fez smashing mm-hmm. walls for Poison Ivy. It's a giant yes. CGI muscular monkey with a little fez. <laughs> So, like, she goes on in the gorilla suit, and an actual gorilla goes following her in a fez. That's her muscle. Ooh, we could have just brought back the monkey from Batman Returns. Mm. The organ grinder oh, who had yeah. the machine gun. Oh, organ. yeah, that's yeah. right. Oh, yeah. that's mm-hmm. I don't mind Bane, but again, he's just there in service to another character. Mm-hmm. Barbara, it's just an entire story thread that doesn't mean anything. No. Right. And his whole thing where he has to find his brother to become the butler to this family who's basically part of a Maharaja's traveling kingdom. Yeah, what the (laughs) hell? Heaven forbid it be a story about wanting to believe that these two can handle this on their own, (laughs) but he's hesitant to tell he's sick because he can see they're fighting and he can see the conflict between them. Mm -hmm. It's all ultimately about getting to that peaceful sense where they settle their conflict so he can accept that they'll be okay on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's your character arc. Mm Mm-hmm. There's so many things on top of other things in this movie. And the other thing is, after he took two, did he call them in the morning? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> no, you weren't supposed to use it intravenously. I meant drink it. Yeah. Right, right. No, it's and topical. He's just Rub got it, on it your sitting there right in his gauntlet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why did he have it on him? Yeah. In glass yeah. vials. Here's the part that... Bo- Internally lit glass <laughs> vials. Here's the part that throws me off on that sequence, is I like everything leading up to that line, because I like that it's a fallen villain that we're not going to mm-hmm. kill, mm-hmm. and it's a perfect Batman moment that we haven't really seen in the films, is Batman actually inspiring the villain mm-hmm. right. to look back on their lost humanity and do the right yeah. thing. Yeah. That's a really great build and moment, mm-hmm. and then it's ruined by, take two Bloody of these... Like- Call and call me morning. in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then who in their right mind would put him and Ivy in the same cell? Why? That's, that's not yeah, going to no. go well. his armor. Why? Yeah, <laughs> that's not going to go well. No. no. They were complicit in that. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. 
<laughs> you killed guard Jesse. <laughs> We're gonna make you two fight it out. How many stems <laughs> can I break off before they stop growing back? <sighs> That's another thing is like they established that like her entire body has been replaced by plant tissue. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it would be cool if she didn't have the muscle. What could make her physically intimidating in a battle is she heals. Mm-hmm. You know, she'll like regrow a limb if it gets torn off. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, CGI wasn't that great at this point. Yeah. And what if it is, is the more damage she takes when it grows back, it's more plant like. Mm-hmm. And so she starts to become like bark and vines and leaves and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm. She'd kind of be like the plant version of Tetsuo mm. and Akira. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whoa. Ooh, yeah. Wouldn't Ooh. that be great? Ooh, like they throw a ton of fertilizer on her and she just keeps growing. Yeah. <laughs> Attack of the 50 foot poison ivy. That'd be amazing. I know, right? Oh. Uh, and then like they just hit her with like some Dutch elm. <laughs> They just shake a bunch of... They throw a bunch of the Japanese beetles on her. Yeah. (laughs) The emerald borers. (laughs) Termites. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Unless anything else you want to bring up. No, I think I got it done. There was a Clockwork Orange reference that there I was. saw this time I saw through. the Drugs area. I, yeah, the Clockwork Orange goons were in there, so mm-hmm. I appreciate that. Other than that, I think we covered pretty much everything. It's almost fitting if we don't bring up Elle McPherson at all, because she's so <laughs> yeah. inconsequential to the plot. Yeah. Why is she there? <laughs> I didn't bother putting it in the synopsis. It's literally just one scene of them talking about their relationship, and he's thinking about Ivy, and that's it. And I remember in the promotional things, they're like, oh, he's got a new girlfriend. It's Elle McPherson. Like, well, she's very beautiful. And what's funny is then the woman who plays Nora Freeze is the actual woman that George Clooney was dating at the time. Oh, really? Oh, that? Wow. The only major cut from the script, the only major chunk of the script that wasn't there was the observatory party. You know, there's that bit where Bruce senses that Poison Ivy is in the room and he looks back and he sees Pamela Isley and he's walking away. He keeps looking back. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be a scene where he gets hit with the pheromones and he goes up and pledges his love to Pamela Isley Mm -hmm. in front of his fiance, which Mm -hmm. causes her to dump him. Okay. Okay. But then as he's looking back on that at the Batcave, he like brings up a picture of Pamela Isley and a picture of Poison Ivy. Ivy and realizes they're the same person. <laughs> oh no! And that's when he realizes the whole pheromone thing mm-hmm. and is trying to warn Dick about it. And then Dick is being a dick. <laughs> but then that's also what leads Dick to then wear the rubber lips. Oh yeah, we haven't mentioned that Dick wears protection. Oh yeah. Oh boy. Which, given the safe sex PSA that was in 2000 Malibu Road. Mm-hmm. Oh god. <laughs> this was much better handled here. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. missed that episode. Oh boy also be glad that you missed Alicia Silverstone in The Babysitter. Oh my god, yes. Oh dear. That was a thing. Awful, awful. So a few other things I got in my notes. Jeep Swenson, who was the bodybuilder who played Bane, mm-hmm. sadly passed away just two months after the movie was released at like age 35. Oh, wow. oh. Yeah. Poor guy. Heart trouble, I'm guessing? Yeah, because yeah. he was a gigantic bodybuilder. Yeah. Oh, Gossip Gertie. What did you think about Gossip Gertie, Melissa? Who is played by Bob Kane's wife? Yeah, that I appreciate. Yeah. But you know what? For stunt casting like that, she was fine. Yeah. For like a little side character, that's not yeah. bad. She's one of the returning characters from Batman Forever. Yeah, I mean, she's playing a very similar role to the last time. Probably not necessarily essential to anything, but she's fun at what she's doing. I like that that's a fun way to work in a cameo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They actually give her a character. She's like in multiple scenes and she does kind of drive little moments here and there. Mm -hmm. And I love the way that she plays it and the costume and everything. She looks like she stepped right out of the 60s show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And apparently this was the last film that Bob Kane got to visit on set. Oh, okay. He actually enjoyed the Schumacher movies. Mm-hmm. He thought that's they were good. Fun. At See, least somebody did. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then those two scientists, I also wanted to mention, because Angie, those yeah. were Kimberly Scott and Michael Paul Chan. The moment Kimberly Scott came back, I'm like, oh, yeah. she's back again. Yay. Because she's been in so many Joel Schumacher. Yeah. She was the woman in Flatliners who Kevin Bacon was bullying. Okay. You know? mm-hmm. This is sadly the last time either of them appeared in a Joel Schumacher film, hmm. which is weird because they've been popping up in his movies yeah. since the late 80s. Mm-hmm. And this is like the eighth for Kimberly Scott. She was even in 2000 Malibu Road. Yep. And then Michael Paul Chan. It is like the fifth for him. Mm. Apparently, she was supposed to be in phone booth, okay. but had to pull out just for schedule conflicts. But apparently, oh. she's been focusing on theater in New York. Okay. So gotcha. it's just been harder to do that. Okay. It's yeah. hard to schedule around theater gigs. Yeah, Joel yeah. even brought up how much he enjoyed working with both of them in the commentary. Mm. Speaking of cameos, Senator Patrick Leahy. What? Oh, my God. Is in the auction sequence. Really? He's not <laughs> one of the ones who bids. He's just oh. the old guy in glasses, like, looking around at everybody. <laughs> extra, extra. He uh-huh. was also in Batman Forever, and he's had cameos 
cameos in five Batman movies Mm -hmm. because he's noted for being a very vocal fan of Batman to the point where he's Um, even written introductions to Batman collections. hmm. Yeah. And it was Joel who first actually bonded with him over Batman and put him in forever and this movie. Cool. John Dykstra's visual effects, Mm -hmm. what's nice, and we mentioned this in the Batman Forever episode, is you can see in a lot of the swooping through the city shots and all that stuff, it's very much him testing a lot of what he would do when he did the first Raimi Spider-Man movie. Yeah. And in fact, this one was the first one. They used rod puppets in Batman Forever with CGI capes, but this one, the figures are full CGI. This was his first time doing full CGI figures. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I could tell. Yeah. The cityscape is a miniature, but they built a CG version of the city in order to animate the shots and then use those with a motion control camera mm-hmm. to go through the actual miniature. Cool. I thought the CG holds up pretty well. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, it was used very sparingly. Some of the compositing is like, oh. Yeah. Eh. Especially when you watch it in HD today, you know, right. it tends to show up all those flaws. Yeah. More what shows up to me as flaws are like the bad miniature shots of like the doors exploding off the rocket. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. that too. I don't have a problem with CGI that's visibly CGI as long as it's still animated well. In the same way, I don't have a problem if stop motion looks like stop motion as long as it's animated well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, or a matte painting looks like a matte painting as long as it's animated well. Well, we seem to have this disconnect with CGI. Well, the CGI kind of falls into that Uncanny Valley stuff, not just with right. human mm-hmm. beings, but also the, it looks just real enough, but it's not, yeah. and I therefore am suspicious. Mm-hmm. Often, especially poorly done CGI, it doesn't have a good sense of space around it. There's something about miniature shots, even when done today versus CGI. Once again, it goes into that uncanny valley about you can't quite explain it, but there's something about actual model shots that you can tell. Yeah. Like yeah. there is space in there. There is room for things to be not quite so perfect, etc., etc. Yeah. It's just a little distracting, I guess, sometimes yeah. to me. It just doesn't look quite right. And so it takes you out of the film for a moment. Here's the thing. If the film was better, we wouldn't be bitching about the CGI. Right, right. <laughs> well, and again, is it that the CGI is bad or just that it's of its time? Because again, yeah. I really like how a lot of those shots are animated. This and Forever were like some of the first films where we really got people swooping through cityscapes mm-hmm. in a superhero movie. And again, like thinking about where we ended up with Spider-Man. It's like, mm. you even look at that first Spider-Man film, it's like, yeah, you can tell it's CG, but it's still exciting. It's still dynamic in how it's animated. Well, yeah. CG is a tool. And just yeah. like any other tool, there mm-hmm. are good ways to use it. There are better ways to use it. There are worse ways to use it. I think, yeah, the fact that they're surfing on rocket doors doesn't hold up. Yeah. I mean, there's something that was proven on the Lord of the Rings movies is if you use CGI right or at least 20 years ago, the way to really use it is make the spaces actually exist. Like the cities and the caverns and everything that was built in models Mm -hmm. and the faraway characters, that's what you make CGI. It's just animation. It's all about do you animate it well or do you animate it poorly? Oh, yeah. And Mm -hmm. how well does it tell the story? Yeah, and there's also, if you're blending it with live action, you have to be cognizant of how well it blends with the uh, environment. Yeah. They looked a little bit like rubber people to me. Yeah, and they would have in 1997. So a little bit of a failure on the animation to me. Well, they are people in rubber. (laughs) Hey! Mm -hmm. To be fair, what's interesting is like Batman Forever, they were wearing full rubber suits that weighed like 130 pounds, (gasps) including the cape. Yeah. In this one, this was the first one they did foam latex, Uh so it was a lot lighter and a lot more flexible. Mm -hmm. Nice. But it also tore a lot more easily. And there's a few bits where you can see like under the arms where it's tearing open. Yeah. Mm. So, oh I'll- my God, they must have just poured out of their costumes at the end of the shoot. Mm hmm. Ugh. One thing I forgot to mention on Batman Forever was Batman Forever was nominated for an Oscar for cinematography. Okay. I buy it. And that was Stephen Goldblatt, who also did this one. One other person I really want to mention is the second unit director, Peter McDonald, who Joel in his commentary openly says was much more adept at the action sequences and a lot of the bike chase was him. Some Mm -hmm. of the big fight scenes were him. Peter McDonald is the director of Rambo 3 and NeverEnding Story 3. (laughs) Oh boy. And Jean-Claude Van Damme's The Legionnaire. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. And he was the cinematographer on Solar Babies. (gasps) Wow. By the way, both of you are people that I've shown Solar Babies to. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. He was a very known, I think he finally just retired because he was born in 1939. Yeah. He was a very renowned second unit director. Mm -hmm. And some of his second unit work was on Empire Strikes Back, Mm -hmm. Excalibur, Dragon Slayer, Tim Burton's Batman. Nice. Radio Flyer, the second, third, and fourth Harry Potter movies, The Bourne Ultimatum, X-Men Origins Wolverine, Mm -hmm. Wrath of the Titans. (laughs) And Guardians of the Galaxy. Hmm. Wow. 
I mean, you would look at his credits, like even if you look at like his assistant editing thing, he's been working in the industry, incredibly prolific guy mm-hmm. who you don't think of because he's not the main credited director. Oh, but, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But he's always been known very much for being able to work with stunt crews really well. And he's known for doing a lot of action-heavy sequences. Mm. So I think Joel, who, again, had never really done an action movie before Batman Forever, Mm -hmm. talked about how it was very helpful to have McDonald involved. And McDonald would very much take Joel's style of shooting and framing and use that to help build sequences that then he would direct. Interesting. Okay. I really like the motorcycle chase, and it has a very Joel Schumacher flair, but barely any of that was actually directed by Joel. Mm-hmm. I didn't really care for it, honestly. Once you had, even I, though part of it's down a giant arm. Human. No, no, that was that <laughs> was the, the other... that was the chase from the museum. Yeah, I'm talking about the drag race. Oh, it all blurs together. I only watched it like yeah. four hours ago. It all blurs together. I think it would have been better had we actually had the eight year old on a motorcycle in the race. I agree. <laughs> Again, go hard or go home. Yeah. Well, I just want you to see Joel Schumacher's purple neon version of the Acura motorcycle. <laughs> Speaking of the vehicles, any thoughts on the vehicles in this movie? I keep going back to that quote from Amadeus. There's too many notes, (laughs) sir. (laughs) There's just too much going on. Oh, my God. A lot of the problem I have with the set design in general and the prop design is there's detail on top of detail on top of detail. It looks like primarily what they're going for is kind of this overblown 50s aesthetic or even overblown art deco aesthetic. But there's a certain amount of minimalism in those design movements. And this is like, okay, we've got this big shape and let's put a lot of little shapes in it. Fuck, we'll put some lights on it too. And then, and then we'll light gels. it. From, yeah, and then <laughs> we'll belly light it. And See, and I love that. <laughs> but the thing is, there's just so much going on. It doesn't give good clean lines on anything. And uh And there's so much of, why is that even there? (laughs) Why are all those points there? Why are there so many points coming out of everything? It's like design for the sake of design, which is something I, it's a personal thing. Again, if Mario Bava (laughs) had done this, it wouldn't have been any different. (laughs) It just would have been more. I think it would have been a lot cleaner. It would have been more reds and blues instead of lavenders and oranges. Yes, but I think it would be a lot more. There's a certain minimalism to the design in his movies, you know, that really classy 50s, 60s, big flat shapes sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of working with that. Whereas this is like the Batmobile has swoops and fins and pieces that go through and there's lights inside and then there's more fins on the fins and points and things. And it's kind of a mess. I'm just glad it Mm -hmm. didn't look like a ribbed cock this time. I mean, it was still uh, very ribbed mm -hmm. though. (laughs) It's very ribbed. It is, but it didn't look like a dildo. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's too much pointy bits going on for that. Yeah, that would be very uncomfortable. But yeah, I don't care for it at all. The thing is, the Batmobile was such a small part of this, and it's interesting how they're trying to hybridize it. It's almost like they're trying to get the shape of the Burton one back, the mm-hmm. way it kind of swoops up in front. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the way that it's then so squashed in back, it makes it look cartoony, mm-hmm. that he has the single seat where it's just open, makes him look right. tiny. And then the fins are still just a bad idea. Fins, yeah. Yeah. I was never a big fan of the bat fins. And then there's like the motorcycle and then the weird swamp boat, the bat swamp boat with the big fan on the back. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. Why? That whole sequence where they're on vehicles to get to the observatory because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To sell toys. It's like, why would they even have that? Why would that be in the garage? To be fair, Joel went into this film knowing that they were going to sell as many toys as they could. Sure, but... I know, but still. Yeah. Yeah. Still. Why wouldn't you make something really cleanly designed that would be easy for the toy makers to make? Those poor toy makers. I think, again, like, (laughs) the shapes are okay, but yeah, then once you get into the inner exposed lighting and the turbines and all that stuff, then Mm -hmm. it gets weird. And then Mr. Freeze's truck with all the spikes in the (gasps) front, and then it opens into a rocket ship. I'm just thinking Edward Norton. It's a rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Mm-mm. Ooh, I want a still of Edward Norton doing that it's a rocket ship joke as he's holding up the Batman Forever Batmobile, which was the most penisy of all the designs. We can make that work. <laughs> like the Batman Forever one literally looked like the penis car from Ambiguously Gay Duo. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the score. Any thoughts on the score? I'm a, such a big fan of Danny Elfman that this is just lesser than Danny Elfman. I do appreciate that it's not trying to be Danny Elfman. That's okay. But I'm lukewarm on the score, honestly. Yeah, I agree. There wasn't anything about it that was bad, but yeah, it didn't really stand out to me either. It was fine. I like the score. I think it helped with this one in Batman Forever to actually just listen to the score separately. 
They're really well produced, but they're so lost in everything else that's going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even though they're doing a lot of wild, I like her doing the striptease with the wild saxophone going off. Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. Like again, like Batman Forever, where it's like this very wild theremin score for the Riddler. Mm-hmm. It has its flourishes and it has its dramatic bits, but it doesn't grab your attention. Yeah. It doesn't distract you, mm-hmm. but it's also not something you go back and think about. Like, I don't think his main Batman theme that da 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 is mm-hmm. bad. It's again just unfortunate that the Danny Elfman one just grabs you. It's so iconic. And again, well, that's because it played over that whole opening credits where you're just going through the bat symbol as this... Mm -hmm. You know, it just keeps going and flourishing all over the place. And then, of course, that it became the old Batman the Animated Series theme, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like Jerry Goldsmith just doing a random score for Star Trek the motion picture and then suddenly the next generation latches (laughs) onto that and it becomes classic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm Because it was a good score. I think Ellie Glenthal, it's fun is because he does so many like dead serious films where it's just these very dark, moody, atmospheric scores. It's kind of fun hearing him get to do a score where he gets to play. Because mm-hmm. a lot of his scores are just these very industrial soundscapes. Yeah. And this one is just like a big, noisy score. <laughs> big, noisy score. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then just want to take a minute to just bring up the soundtrack. Uh-oh. Which was infamous for having a lot of songs that don't even appear in the movie. Sadly, yeah. this one wasn't produced by the RZA, who did the Batman Forever one. I do think it's lost a little bit because of that. Mm-hmm. Why are Smashing Pumpkins on here? Because they were big at yeah. the time. Why? I mean, that's... I know! You know. So let me, but why? Let me just, re- really quickly, here's just a quick list of what's in the soundtrack. Oh dear. We had both The End is the Beginning is the End and The Beginning is the End is the Beginning by the Smashing Pumpkins. Mm-hmm. They opened and closed the CD. Yep. Oh my god. Yeah. Look Into My Eyes by Bone Thugs and Harmony. Uh. Gotham City by R. Kelly. Boo. Boo. House on Fire by Arcana. Revolution by R.E.M. Mm. Probably the biggest hit at the time, Foolish Games by Jewel. Which has. I don't know oh, why yeah. that's on this season. Yeah, it has I don't nothing know why to do with this either. movie. No. Nothing, yeah. Lazy Eye by the Goo Goo Dolls. Breed by Lauren Christie. The Bug by Soul Coughing. <laughs> that was actually a fun song. Yeah, it no is. No video for it, but it was a fun song. It is. Uh, fun for Me by Moloko. Poison Ivy by Michelle. Indegio Cello. Uh, Indegio Cello. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. True to Myself by Eric Benet. The Batman Overture by Elliot Goldenthal. And one of the weirdest inclusions on this, Moner by Underworld. <laughs> Which, again, I listened to all these songs last night. And I don't know why they're here other than, hey, we had a soundtrack CD to sell. Exactly. <laughs> it's the, hey, they've been signed to Warner Brothers. That's what happened. And what I love is that it's still like music inspired by the film Batman and Robin. And it's like no. most of these were singles that were made even before Batman Forever. Yep. Yeah. They're artists that were signed by Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. It's a Warner Brothers sampler. That's what it is. It's like the only one that ties into it is R. Kelly's Gotham City. Yeah. But it's... Barely? (laughs) Literally, like, his whole song is, it's a city of justice. It's a city of love. It's a city of hope where you find heroes for its own. It's like, do you not know Gotham City, sir? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That sounded very up with people. I don't think we're talking about the same city here. It sounded very much like going back to St. Elmo's Fire with the Man in Motion song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounded like they took a separate song and just switched one word to Gotham. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah and of course it, yeah, it has wrong. a church choir yeah yeah anything leap out to you on that soundtrack i did buy it at the time because i was at that right age for it i really liked the smashing pumpkins but i don't think i got too much listening out of it beyond those two songs because most of the rest that's here i mean even though i like some of the artists the songs themselves are just not particularly that good Beyond Foolish yeah. Games, like I said, which has nothing to do with anything. And I already had that Jewel right. CD, so I didn't need it on here. Yeah, I think the biggest one to mention is, of course, End is the Beginning is the End. The more popular one is Beginning is the End is the Beginning, which was used in the Watchmen trailer, of course. Yeah. yeah. Which was a direct reference, because there's several actual direct references to this movie in Watchmen, because Zack Snyder. Because <laughs> why not? I think that one's the more popular one because it's the slower, quieter, moody version. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And end is the beginning is the end is the more rocking yeah. up rhythm. And it was a single at the time. I yeah. mean, now yeah. the other one has overshadowed it. But at the time, that was the one everybody knew. And of course, it's the one on the soundtrack that got a music video directed by Joel Schumacher. Mm-hmm. Yes. So Angie, what did you think about the music video? 
I love those instruments they're playing. Whoever yes. designed those. Neon steampunk. Very, oh. very good job on that. You know, beyond that, it's not very special, right? It's like basically the band on green or blue screen, then a bunch of clips of the movie behind them. But yeah, those instruments are just fantastic. That's a reason to watch the music video <laughs> alone right there. Almost all of Joel's music videos are basically just shots of the band intercut with clips of the movie. Mm -hmm. This one was a little more inventive. I kind of like that it's a giant statue of the bat cowl above the clouds. Yeah. And as we're pushing in, what's interesting about the different mood that we get from the movie is that we then go inside the statue where everything's inverted and you see all the rivets and seams. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I want that Batman movie where you get into the, I want the grimy punk goth Batman movie. <laughs> well, yeah. Little did I know at the time of this recording that we would then be getting the Robert Pattinson Batman, which I adore. It has clips of the movies projected on the inside of the statue mm -hmm. while the band is all distorted and flickering like they themselves are projections, even though they're standing before the projections. Mm -hmm. It's pure just artistic nonsense, but it looks fine. Again, the instruments are great. I love everyone dressed in black. Once everyone is suddenly being strung from wires and floating around, they look uncomfortable. Yeah, well, <laughs> well they probably were. Yeah. <laughs> But again, it's like, I like that aesthetic. I like that the giant statues are such a thing in the Joel Schumacher movie, even though they go back to the Burton ones. Mm -hmm. It's kind of neat just having a different inversion of those statues for just even a brief moment of that video. Again, it's a great song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a really nice song. It's catchy. It's got fun lyrics. The little chorus really yeah. does pull you in. It probably makes about as much sense as Kiss from a Rose does, but it still right. works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it didn't really tie into Watchmen either, but it fit right. the mood better. Yeah. Honestly, it would be a great song for Batman Beyond. Yeah, it would. Mm, yeah. Man, imagine like the neon black light Joel Schumacher Batman Beyond. <laughs> and I'm saying that sincerely. Like, the, uh, No, I, I get it. Yeah, like I, almost I see flat you liners, there. you know, yeah. edgier and dark. And yeah. We never got like a Joel Schumacher cyberpunk movie, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. I want a Joel Schumacher cyberpunk movie. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all yeah, can have that. I could totally see Batman Beyond just get grumpy old... Uh, Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. Yeah. Mm. Reprises Batman. Yep. Yes. Again, little did we know at the time. And then I just threw out on Twitter just if anyone had any feedback they wanted to throw in on what they thought about the film and its place in Joel Schumacher's legacy. I got two people who responded. <laughs> it's Batman and Robin people. Come on. <laughs> So J.D., our frequent friend mm -hmm. of the show and frequent guest host J.D., said, I remember at the time really liking Batman Forever when it came to HBO. It hasn't aged as well as the Burton films, which have also not entirely aged well, but it's not horrible, just cheesy. Batman and Robin really is just flat out bad, and even as a teen, I recognize that. It feels both simultaneously part Joel's work, but not representative of him. Its flaws stand out more than his other work. And then interesting, on the flip side, Evie, my old co-host <laughs> on I Hate Love Remakes, friend of the show, she's been on multiple episodes, loved Batman Forever when I was a kid, mainly because of Nicole Kidman. I don't remember my feelings on Batman and Robin when I first saw it, but I know later on I went along with the idea that it was terrible. Nowadays, I think Forever is fine, maybe a little shaky because Val Kilmer seems kind of meh, but Batman and Robin feels like a love letter to Adam West Batman, and I'm here for it. Joel deserves way more credit for his Batman movies than he gets. With regards to his legacy, I think they're like the wine that ripened over time of his oeuvre. Nice. <laughs> it's good that at least if we only got two, they are two that are like on opposite sides of the coin. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And then I'll also splice in a little clip here. We had Michael May on our A Time to Kill episode. Mm -hmm. And here's what he said on the movie. Just out of curiosity, Michael, you said your views on Batman and Robin have changed over the years. Yeah. When I first saw it, I felt the same way about it that the rest of the universe seems to feel about it, which is it was trash and abomination and <laughs> ruined the franchise, which it did. But having watched it more recently and coming around to the idea that camp in the Batman films was not inappropriate. Mm -hmm. It was not what people were expecting. And it was not what they were selling. But it does have a lot in common with the Adam West series. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just at the time, it was not what we wanted. Wanted. But with some distance, I've been able to just enjoy it on the camp level. Yeah. People are just 
the bad guy performances of that they're just chewing the scenery and just having a ball <laughs> and i just i love it i love arnold's crappy cheesy one-liners <laughs> but i've always loved george clooney's performance in that i hate that he has publicly talked about feeling responsible for mm-hmm. killing the series mm-hmm. because i do not think that's on his shoulders at all i think he's in a different movie than everybody else i think he's acting a different way <laughs> than everybody else is but i love especially his bruce wayne i love the way bruce wayne is written in it i love how mm-hmm. it's the only of those first four movies where he doesn't rip off his mask and reveal a secret identity to the female lead. I love his relationship with Alfred in that. I love mm-hmm. you old man line just rips me <laughs> apart every time. There's a lot that I really, really like about it. It's an interesting film that it's still divisive. Yep. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that have grown fond of it and a lot of people that just continue to hate it. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So any other final thoughts on the broader Batman and Robin experience before we go into the box office data? I guess, like I said, to me, I find it interesting that it's sort of like the more I watch it, the more I find for it to appeal to me. And I don't know if that's Stockholm Syndrome or something. (laughs) But but I mean, it's the kind of thing where I'm like, maybe I'll wait five years and watch it again, you know, and just see if there's more that I appreciate there or not. I don't know. I think it's the kind of thing that if you've been sitting around and you've always heard it's absolutely terrible, you should watch it anyway. Because who knows, you might actually enjoy it. Well, and then I wonder how much that's also that so many people, this is the film that defines Joel Schumacher for them. Right. Yeah. Whereas, you know, especially you and me, Angie, mm-hmm. we've gone on such a broader Joel Schumacher journey. Yeah. Even if we don't like it, we don't hate it. Right, right. Emelis, I know you're, you haven't been quite as deep on the journey as us, but <laughs> yeah. how do you feel this fits within the overall Joel Schumacher? I think it's a lower point. I mean, I know he's made a lot worse, but he's certainly made better. And it's somewhere in the middle. I mean, a lot of my past with this has been hating it kind of on principle, along with the rest of the comics world. But these days, it's just like, eh, it's just not entirely successful at what it was trying to be. Yeah, I think it is exactly the movie they set out to make, whether or not that's the movie that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. That's a different thing. And I think part of it is I would love to have, again, something more like Flatliners and Falling Down, where it's Joel getting a much juicier, deeper material. Yes. Mm -hmm mixed with just how wild the aesthetic got here. Yeah. Like, I want a murder mystery set at a fashion show. (laughs) (laughs) Dan Waters does have an unproduced script called Model Daughter, which is that premise. (laughs) And I want Joel Schumacher to freaking direct that movie. I just want the two of them to work together, absolutely. (laughs) Because I think they would make each other laugh, Mm -hmm. you know, and they would have fun. I don't consider it really a low point, but it's definitely a contrast. Mm -hmm. Because people hold this up as what defines Joel Schumacher, but other than Batman and Robin, Batman Forever, and maybe Phantom of the Opera, we haven't gotten to it yet. Mm -hmm. He hasn't really done anything else like that. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like what entirely launched this project anyways was just the intrigue and the variety of his career. The drama, the comedy, the Mm -hmm. big movies, little movies, actor-driven movies, concept-driven movies. How he just kind of does all different kinds of things because he wanted to do as many different things as he could. Uh, This is his first time doing anything like this. And I don't think it's as unsuccessful as some people hold it to be. I think Batman Forever, people were easier to get into it because there is a darker undercurrent to it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also sloppy and doesn't hold together as well as this one does. This one just lacks any undercurrent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like one of the notes I wrote to myself early on when I was watching this was, I liked this movie better when it was called Running Man, (laughs) because, you know, I just saw the Mr. Free stuff and it's like, I, what, yes, it's right up here at the top. Oh, no, I'm looking at Hanna-Barbera sound effect on the Glow Boys. Yes, it's true. There were Hanna-Barbera. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) But starting from that uh, Mr. Freeze ice sequence, it's like Running Man works. Especially like revisiting it now, it's gotten a lot better over the recent years. It's amazing. Oh, Running Man's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's a movie with the dumb gloss, but there is substantial cynicism and undercurrent underneath it. It's just hiding as a big dumb action movie. And that's something very appealing. And I feel like if Batman and Robin was either just the surface or it was that sort of surface with a good undercurrent under it, either way it would have worked. This just did not fall together quite as well. 
actually Running Man, again, like the films of Stephen E. DeSouza, he's another writer that I hold very much like Dan Waters, where it's big, dumb, silly movies that are also really sharp and witty. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. the guy who wrote Running Man is the guy who wrote and directed Street Fighter. Yes. Oh, okay. And Street Fighter is more like what I wish this film was. I think okay, yeah. I think he's not as good at how over the top and grandiose everything could. Like, imagine Street Fighter with this aesthetic. Yeah. Mm. But it's funny and it's got wit to it. It's mm-hmm. got wit and it's sharp yeah. while also being very stupid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, like one of the funniest moments in that movie is still Zangief going, quick, somebody change the channel. Yes. <laughs> I need to watch that again. With, I'm not going to give any context yet. It's been I mean, years. like, again, like... DeSouza, he wrote Die Hard. He wrote Commando. Mm -hmm. He knows how to write things that are big, dumb, silly spectacle that are also sharp, have character, and are witty, and there's underlying themes to it. Mm -hmm. And again, him and Dan Waters co-wrote Hudson Hawk. Mm. I I unabashedly love Hudson Hawk. You're not alone. It's a fun movie. (laughs) It it is. There are problems with that movie. But oh boy, do I ever love it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and again, it's like, that's what's missing from this movie is that wit. Right, I agree. And that bite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wish that he had brought in, like, you know, the guy who wrote Flatliners with him, or Ebby Rose Smith who wrote Falling... Like, imagine if you brought in Ebby Rose Smith, the guy who wrote Falling Down, Mm -hmm. to just punch up a Batman script. Oh, yeah. Oh, it'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. By the way, I saw Mad City, which is another film written by Ebby Rose Smith, that he was brought in to punch up the script. Perfect companion piece to Falling Down. Wonderful movie. Mm -hmm. Nice. So it was getting into the box office release of the film. It opened on June 20th, 1997. And in the top 10 at the time, already in theaters, we had films like The Fifth Element, Gone Fishing, Austin Powers 1, Speed 2, <laughs> and The Lost World Jurassic Park. And at number three was Con Air. Mm. <sighs> That's another movie that I feel has gotten better over the years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then opening at number two that week was My Best Friend's Wedding. Oof. Okay. And Batman and Robin opened at number one mm-hmm. and did $42 million in its opening weekend. Okay. Which is that's good. That's big. Mm-hmm. I know, that's big. But the thing is, Batman Forever opened at $77 million in its opening weekend. That's nah. why they instantly greenlit this film. Okay. Got it. In its second week, Batman and Robin had already dropped to number three. Oh, boy. <laughs> Not surprised. Jumping up to number two in its 11th week was Hercules. Oh, my God. And opening at number one was Face Off. (sighs) And that deserves it so hard. (laughs) Such a good movie. (laughs) I love Face Off so much. In its third week of release, Batman and Robin was already down to number five. Mm -hmm. Wow. Again, only pulling in eight million. That was the week that Out to Sea opened at number six. Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau. Uh, Oh, boy. With Joel Schumacher, favorite Diane Cannon. Yeah. That's fun. It's not Grumpy Old Men, but it's fun. Mm Mm-hmm. Opening at number one that week at $50 million was Men in Black. Okay. That's some pretty stiff competition there. Yeah. Face Off and Men in and Black. And again, talk about a redefinition of the comic book movie opening at the same time. Yes. Yeah. And that's a movie that works. Mm-hmm. I love Men in Black. In its fourth week of release, Batman Rob is down number seven. Keeps dropping two each time. <laughs> Men, in, Men in Black is still number one. Mm-hmm. Yep. Face Off is still number three. God, that would have been a fun double feature to go see. Opening at number nine is A Simple Wish. Oh, boy. Yeah. And opening at number two was Contact. Okay. Oh, wow. Which I like Contact, but it was not going to succeed with Men in Black in its second No, week, Oh, God, you no. Know? <laughs> no, but it's a great movie. I like it, too. It's not a barnstormer, but it's... Maybe. It's heavy-handed, but it's good. I still mm-hmm. haven't seen it. Oh, really? Believe it or not, yeah. It's a very smart movie. So we're going to drop off here because in its fourth week, Batman and Robin is already at number 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Men in Black is still number one. Mm-hmm. Sure. Contact has been bumped to number three because opening at number two, George of the Jungle. Oh, wow. Oh, Brendan Fraser. George, 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 George of the jungle. jungle. friend to you and me. Let me just check here. Yeah, Batman and Robin is already down to number 15 mm-hmm. by the next week. So oh, we're that... already out of the top 10. Ooh, that's the week that Good Burger opened at number five. <laughs> I got that <laughs> high. I'm surprised. I know, right? Wow. Well, and that's the week that Air Force One opened at number one. Okay. Oh, I remember that week. So God, yeah, there was a week where in the top 10, there was Air Force One, Men in Black, Face Off, Hercules, My Best Friend's Wedding, Contact, and Good Burger. Wow. <laughs> That's variety. 
<laughs> yeah, so I mean, it definitely did not have the legs that Batman. Well, yeah. again, even Batman Forever, while it had that huge opening weekend, it only played for I want to say like four or five weeks in the top ten. It only was like 180 million domestic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think did 460 something worldwide. And then Batman and Robin, it was a hundred and twenty-five million dollar movie. It mm-hmm. was a very mm-hmm. expensive movie. I'm sure. The domestic box office was ultimately only a hundred and seven. Mm, okay. Ouch. And the international was only a hundred and thirty, so Ouch. it total just did two hundred and thirty-eight million at the box office. Oh. So not a bomb. No. But it's it, not it didn't profit. Yeah. But a franchise killer. I mean, that's even if people hadn't panned it, yeah. Well, and then talking about that, just the quick legacy of what happened after this movie. Joel, he wasn't signed for sequels when he did Batman Forever, but when they signed him to Batman and Robin, they signed him to a two-picture deal. Mm -hmm. And he was arguing for, he wanted to either just go back and do Batman Year One, Mm -hmm. or there was also Batman Unchained. The script for this was commissioned in June of 96, so like a year before this film even opened while Batman and Robin was still in production, they already had a script going for the next film in the series. And this one, the studio was going to let him go darker, Mm -hmm. go more twisted, because they were already starting to see that things were changing in terms of what people wanted. Mm -hmm. It was written by Mark Protosevich, who was the writer of The Cell. Oh, wow. The villains were going to be the Scarecrow and Harlequin, who was in this one going to be played as Joker's daughter, which is not that, uh, because there was always the character of the Joker's daughter, so they're just using it. You know what? It makes me happier about that relationship, honestly. Right. And it was going to be Batman getting locked in Arkham Asylum. Mm -hmm. Okay. As all the villains that he's put away in there are run amok. Interesting. And it's Batman with the Scarecrow madness hallucination serum Mm -hmm. exposed to him while surrounded by this madhouse of people that he's put away Mm -hmm. and the daughter of the first villain he ever took out. I could see some interesting stuff being done with that. Oh, yeah, definitely. So here's the thing. Did they somehow get permission or is it just a coincidence that they used that for the first Arkham Asylum game? Well, again, that's also the plot of the Grant Morrison graphic novel, Batman Arkham. Okay, so that's what it's based on. Okay. Because that story has been done in the comics. Joker's also in there, but that's basically Arkham Asylum, is that you keep hallucinating from Scarecrow and yeah, okay. Right. And then parts of what stopped this were, one, the movie didn't do well. Two, Jack Nicholson was not going to come back in any way. Mm. They were hoping to bring him back for like some hallucination sequences. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. But that's also why they kind of focused more on Harlequin. Mm -hmm. And George Clooney didn't want to come back. Mm. There's kind of this myth that Coolio was up for the role of the Scarecrow. That was just something that they joked around with on set while they were filming the motorcycle chasing. The actual people that were in talks to play Scarecrow were either Jeff Goldblum or Nicolas Cage. Oh, wow. So we could have had... I could get behind that. Batman locked in an asylum overseen by an evil Nicolas Cage. <laughs> wow. Face your fears, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which one of those two I like the idea of more, honestly. Right? I know, right? <laughs> and honestly, what I would do is I would cast both and have one be Scarecrow and one be Batman. <laughs> oh, God. And then since we're playing on Insanity halfway through the film, they, they just swap, swap roles. <laughs> <laughs> See, but that's too close to face off. He wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> yes, you would have. Yes. I still think it would have been interesting. Sadly, that script was never really circulated, so nobody can read it. I have no idea whether it was any good or not. Mm -hmm. Protosevich is an interesting writer. Like, I mean, his other big credits were Poseidon and I Am Legend, Mm -hmm. both of which were rewritten by Akiva Goldsman. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm sure Akiva would have been attached to this at some point, too. Sure. So at the time, we also had a Batman versus Superman movie that Wolfgang Peterson was developing. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. That was written by Andrew Kevin Walker. Mm-hmm. Okay, he wrote 7 and 8 millimeter, which we'll be getting to on the next episode, mm-hmm. which was then also rewritten by Akiva Goldsman. And sadly, that's the only version available. Mm-hmm. There was the Justice League movie that George Miller was going to do in the early oh, 2000s. Man. Yeah, I wish that had happened. Yeah, and I've read the script. That's like a full on Incredibles, like just a whole world of superheroes oh, type. Yeah. Of. It's got that fun zaniness to it. Oh, man, I'd love that. And then they did ultimately decide to do Batman Year One, just not with Joel. Mm -hmm. They had Darren Aronofsky developing it with Frank Miller. Yep. And that was in talks for a long time before it fell apart. And I've read that script and it's terrible. Uh Uh-huh. It's like Frank Miller taking his Year One and just going even more Frank Miller with it. Yeah. Like instead of Alfred, Bruce Wayne becomes Batman while being aided by Big Al, the owner of a junkyard. And so it's like the scrapped together junkyard version of Batman and the Batmobile. 
Mm-hmm. There's a whole scene where you get Bruce Wayne standing in a mirror pulling out all of his own teeth. What? So that he can put steel dentures in his mouth. What? <sighs> So that if a villain ever tries to punch him, they break their knuckles on his steel dentures. And they thought this was going to get made? It almost oh. did get made. But... <sighs> I've read that script, and then after Aronofsky and Miller just ultimately left the project because it wasn't happening, mm-hmm. they brought in the Wachowskis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not to direct, but just to kind of look at the script, see what they could do, and then they reshaped it into a treatment which is actually quite good and put more of the focus on Carmine Falcone and the fall of the old style of criminal as Batman came in and ushered in the new style of criminal. And then those aspects were preserved when they ultimately did Batman Begins in 2005. Mm Mm-hmm. And then Batman Begins, you know, ushered in its whole trilogy. And then we've had the Zack Snyder era of Mm -hmm. Batman. And any thoughts on those subsequent Batman incarnations? Not really. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I guess, you know, I remember not being that into Batman Begins for whatever reason. I mean, I liked it, but I didn't love it. I did really like The Dark Knight. I mean, it's hard not to deny that Heath Ledger Mm -hmm. does a fantastic job Mm -hmm. as Joker there. Dark Knight Rises, I didn't hate it as much as a lot of other people did, though I can certainly see why they had issues with it. I've seen the Zack Snyder stuff, but I have, like, no feelings on it. Like, it's so bland to me. It's so uninteresting. Mm -hmm. I'm just not into them at all. I'll give the new one a shot, I'm sure, with this Robert Pattinson, whatever it ends up being. At this point, I'm along for the ride, whatever, but I'm not emotionally (laughs) invested anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I like the Nolan films quite a bit. I like Nolan as a director, so pretty much anything he directs, I'll watch. Definitely, first two were better than the third. You know, I didn't hate the third, but it's not great. It just doesn't come together as well (laughs) as the first two. Batman Beyond was good. I didn't watch a whole lot of episodes of it, but whatever I did watch, it's like they were doing interesting Mm -hmm. stuff. Aces, I like it. Going into the more modern DC movies, I like Wonder Woman. (laughs) (laughs) Aquaman was fun. (laughs) Aquaman is upping the just the pure spectacle. Yeah. Aquaman and Wonder Woman is like, maybe I do have some hope for DC left. By the way, big props to Shazam. I love Shazam. I still haven't seen it. I still have to see Shazam. It's just a good, fun movie. Yeah, I need like to see it. it. I, there's nothing against the character or anything. It's just yeah. I. It's I've big, which is exactly what I thought that movie should have been. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I like the Nolan films. I, I always found Nolan is a little overly complicated. Sometimes that works really well. Sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Again, like Dark Knight Rises, it's just too much going on. And doesn't settle in on what the actual story is. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I think Batman Begins, it's a really good origin story. Mm-hmm. It does a good job of ushering in that world. Dark Knight's still even that kind of all over the place, but it has a through line that is mm-hmm. really strong. And again, both Joker and Two Face are both really well handled. Mm-hmm. And then the Snyder verse, I don't. I... <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I've not hated all of the Snyder. Like, I don't dislike Man of Steel. Man of Steel is kind of a mess. <laughs> Batman versus Superman is trying to be Watchmen, but it's like those 90s comics creators who are in no way Alan Moore yeah. trying to be Watchmen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's just not working. Hey, Batman versus Superman is like the Alan Moore issues of Youngblood. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not going to work out. Boy. And then Justice League, I at least it's a mess and you can feel how chopped together it is by two different directors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it at least was lively. And just to clarify, this is the theatrical cut. The Snyder Cut hadn't come out yet. To be fair, I don't care for the Snyder Cut any more or less than the theatrical cut, but I've written about that elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It at least had an energy to it. It at least moved. It was at least entertaining enough. But there's nothing underneath it. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas Wonder Woman and Aquaman, I think they really have a good idea of their characters, of what the tones are. They really do a good job of building films around them. Shazam again. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest issue was I don't dislike Ben Affleck and I don't dislike, okay, let's do an old gruff grizzled Batman. Mm -hmm. Ben Affleck just doesn't sell old gruff grizzled. No, No, he does not. He looks like a young guy trying to play old gruff grizzled. And he's like in his mid 40s by now. Mm -hmm. I mean, like if you would recast those movies with like Lance Henriksen. (laughs) Like, 75-year-old Lance Hendrickson in a gigantic robot suit. Yeah. (laughs) Even Lance Hendrickson like, Martha, why are you saying that name? (laughs) He could sell that. He could sell that. He could sell that. He could sell that. Mm. And to be fair, I never thought that was a bad twist. That was actually a clever way of spinning the fact that both those characters have the same name mother. (laughs) It was just Ben Affleck is not selling it. that's so... No, I disagree. It's... (laughs) I mean... (laughs) I'm not saying it's a well-executed idea. It's just certainly an idea that someone had. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, 
mean, I can't dispute that. <laughs> Somebody noticed they had the same name and decided yeah. to do something with it. Okay. Fine. Wow. <laughs> how, how could someone else possibly have that same first name? How dare you? No. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. you Bad stole idea. my mother. You can't save your Martha, but you can save mine. <laughs> oh, God. Another thing to bring up is that between Batman and Robin and Batman Begins, while all these other projects were flying around, we finally got 2004's Catwoman movie, Ugh. which I did watch for the first time before for this. Now, Angie, have you ever seen Catwoman? I have not. Melissa, by your side, have you ever seen Catwoman? I have, and I struggle to recall anything about it. It's like those neurons strangled themselves. Mm. I didn't hate it. For me, it falls into the same bucket as the Electra movie. It's like, oh, yeah. it's kind of dire. Electro movie, I don't hate it either. Electro movie, I can see where they're coming from. It just wasn't put together well. The Catwoman movie, what's fascinating by it is because, God, I've read so many drafts of that script, too, in development. Because that's one of those films that everyone in Hollywood did a draft on Catwoman, and they all hated it. Yep. Like, every screenwriter. Like, John Rogers, who is one of the credited screenwriters, mm -hmm. who none of his writing is in the actual film, mm -hmm. he'll tell stories about Catwoman <laughs> till the sun goes down. He loves talking about it and how little it has anything to do with it. And he's gone on to, he's dad writer of leverage and the yeah. librarians and he wrote the core you know the core which i have a certain appreciation for it's a good movie you don't have to defend it. <laughs> <laughs> i mean and the catwoman movie what's fascinating about watching it is it's a very french crew it's directed by the guy who was the effects director of city of lost children and the yep. cinematographer and editor are luke bassones mm -hmm. okay and it's a lot like alien resurrection where it's a very french group of filmmakers with a very french style of filmmaking who are stuck in a Hollywood studio doing a Hollywood studio script. Yeah. They're flourishing the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. It's just a bland, mediocre script. Yeah. The story's not that interesting, but I don't dislike how it's made. The only issues I really have with it are the editing is kind of all over the place and the final costume is terrible. <laughs> yeah. There's a scene where she's in like the full leather outfit and mm -hmm. it's like, that's great. Why didn't you just stick with that? Mm -hmm. But then they get the whole shredded down bikini bandoliers and mm -hmm. yeah, just mm -mm. in a costume designed by the guy who did the Deadpool costume. <laughs> Same guy. Really? He's still one of the top costume designers in the industry. <sighs> you just know a lot of studio notes were probably involved in that. I imagine so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think the direction is doing a lot of interesting things that are just not at all what the audiences were into at the time. And Halle Berry's performance isn't bad. I don't have a problem with her performance. Yeah. And there's a lot of interesting visual stuff they're doing. It's just a mess of the bland, mediocre script, and it's just kind of messily glued together. Mm -hmm. I don't hate it. I don't recommend it like I do Batman and Robin. <laughs> but it's one of those ones where I'm kind of watching it. I'm just kind of like, really? This is what everyone was all angry about. It's just kind of a slap together movie. I think once again, it's one of those, well, this isn't the Catwoman character that we love and want to see on screen, mm -hmm. probably. And she was, though. But I mean, really? I thought she captured the personality of Catwoman. I thought but the things she was still. doing with her performance, it is the full on Eartha Kit era Catwoman. It's just, yeah, it's not the character Selena Kyle, but Selena Kyle's never really had much of a character beyond slinky, sexy cat lady thief. But by the time you got the Catwoman movie, you had the Darwin yeah. Cook take on Catwoman. That's true. And that is magnificent. That's mm -hmm. true. And unfortunately, they were still stuck with the script they've been writing since 1994. Uh. <laughs> I mean, again, I wish they had done the Dan Waters Catwoman and just gone bonkers with it. <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those, I don't recommend the Catwoman movie, but it's like, I now own a digital copy. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have a talk, Noel. <laughs> Hey, again, I'm the one who got both of you to watch Solar Babies, so I have a very different taste. Hey, 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 hey. That yeah. was a fun movie. Uh, 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 <laughs> a certain uh, amount of fun, certain values of fun. Uh, Bodai. Oh, God. <laughs> I think I've blocked out a lot of that movie, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> Ending on that note of... <laughs> of Solar Babies? Of, We're so ending in so old Solar Babies, are we? <laughs> Of so that all happened. <laughs> kind of Solar Babies, Batman and yeah. Robin and Catwoman, that all happened. <laughs> Again, like my final thoughts on the Joel Schumacher Batman movies is most of my problems are just like on a technical story level. But even on Batman and Robin, they're not even trying to do anything complicated. So they kind of get points for not even trying. <laughs> <laughs> they kept it simple and they just went as extravagant and fabulous as they could. It's a fabulous movie. <laughs> I will agree. It's 
fabulous. Yes. Yes. She's literally blowing CGI dust in everyone's faces. I know. Yeah. There's glitter yeah. in here. There's neon oh, lights. There's so much is. reflected water. Each villain has its own style of glitter, you know, between <sighs> his freeze makeup and her dust. Yeah, mm -hmm. He has butt lights. Butt lights. <laughs> There's so many butts in this movie. Those butts are fine. I'm not I shaming mean, I, butts. I'm not shaming nickels here. No, Schumacher's clearly a butt man. That's all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, that's fine by me. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's, it kind of surprises me that we haven't seen as many butts in his movies. Yeah. I'm literally trying to think back on how many butts we've seen in Joel Schumacher movies. We haven't had too many bear butts. I know that. All I can think of is Dying Young when he's on the beach. Ugh, I don't want to think about that movie. it's just a distant Yeah, Dying Young was a terrible movie. <laughs> I mean, and it's one of those things where it's like the 90s Joel Schumacher is, we enjoyed a lot of the stuff he made in the 80s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But the 90s Joel Schumacher is so, because you get him like starting on a high with Flatliners. Yeah. yeah. And then like instantly peaking down with Dying Young Ugh. and 2000 Malibu Road. Mm -hmm. And then kind of recovering with falling down, if not yeah. commercially. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, The Client, fine. Mm -hmm. Batman Forever is, well, that was good I like fun. it. I know. And again, that's <laughs> thing. It's something to bad. And then, you know, Time to Kill was, mm -hmm. again, like, between the Batman yeah, movies, you get the Time to Kill right in between. Yeah. I think the biggest thing about Batman and Robin is it's not really bringing anything new. It's just taking what they did in Batman Forever and doing more of it. Yeah. yeah. It's doubling up on it. Like, if you look at the Burton ones, his first Batman movie and Batman Returns, there's still a lot of difference between them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the biggest problem with Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, if we had had just Batman Forever and he had never done another Batman movie, no one ever would have really had an issue, I think, with Joel Schumacher. And I think yeah. it's just that this one goes so much more of what was in that movie. Yeah. Right. That I think people who didn't like those aspects to see it double down like that. Yeah. And I would also say because of the time period it was yeah. released in and the way that things were trending... You know, that yeah. the backlash was going to be even more severe because of that. And I think there's a certain bitterness of, at that point, there was as much Burton Batman as there was Schumacher Batman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be fair, we had the animated series, which was very Burton influenced. Mm -hmm. Whereas the animated series, their one reference to Joel Schumacher was, shut up, Joel. Shut up, Joel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which I do think was a little overly cruel. And again, I do wonder how much, even subtly, there was an aspect of homophobia. Oh, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. This was that period of the 90s where comic book culture was very much embedded into the base-driven machismo that oh, yeah. nowadays we label the comic skate movement. Yeah, right. It's the people who want to go back to that era that yep. they grew up mm -hmm. with. Whereas now we've gone out and beyond. We can have a wildly gay Batman. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we can have wildly exuberant things that are exploring it culturally in different perspectives than big, gritty Batman with fists and machine guns. If a straight man had put nipples on the bat suit, then it would just be a manly bodybuilder thing and not a gay thing, right? A mm -hmm. straight man would have put them on the Catwoman suit <laughs> i don't know that warner brothers would have approved it but <laughs> no yeah. they just would have done the bumps like they did on the back girl suit yeah you know? <laughs> it's just cold yeah <laughs> what that's how you know he's mr freeze because all the nipples are all out. that technology in those suits and they can't even keep the people warm oh my god <laughs> <laughs> right, everyone was way too hot on those yeah, actually. <laughs> no, I imagine yeah. they were just losing like 10 yeah. pounds of water weight every day they were shooting. Yeah. Well, that's why they went with the foam latex. It was a lot lighter yeah. and a lot cooler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even with the foam latex, you just drew Well, the out. backs were also entirely open. Oh, that's Whenever cool. you'd see them, they actually had entirely open backs. And even uh -huh. when they're facing the front, the cape had a hole in it. Okay. So their backs okay. were completely exposed. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Give them a little relief. That's good. Oh, thank yeah. God. I understand the reactions. I don't entirely sympathize with all of the reactions against this movie. Mm -hmm. I understand why some people don't like it. I don't agree with other people who don't like it. You know? <laughs> like Last Jedi. I can understand some of the criticisms of Last Jedi. Oh, yeah. I certainly don't sympathize with a lot of the criticism of Last right. Jedi. Yes, you know? right. Oh, boy. I had an interesting conversation at work about the Captain Marvel movie with a co-worker. Oh, boy. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> exactly what you would expect it to be. Oh, boy. <laughs> mm. So Batman and Robin, that was, again, it, it, it's, it's a movie that happened. It's not wrong to call it a milestone because oh, yeah. nothing was ever the same after this for Joel's career yeah. or for comic book movies in general. Yeah. Right. And it's interesting how every single time a new comic book movie, we're seeing this with the Matt Reeves Batman movie. It's like as they're announcing cast members, we have people screaming, oh, it's just like the Joel Schumacher Batman all over again. It's like, but how? In what way how is could it this possibly all be? like, have you <laughs> yeah. not seen a single Matt Reeves movie? 
have you not seen a single film that Robert Pattinson has been in outside of Twilight, which even then he was given a pretty intense performance in Twilight at times. <laughs> Pattinson yeah. is a pretty decent performer. Oh, he's a legit actor, especially if you look at some of the films he's been making in the last few years. Oh, goodness, yeah. yes. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to give a shout out to is the TV series Gotham. I really like Gotham because I think Gotham does a good job of being both the crime drama and campy and dark twisted horror and psychological character study. I think it does a really good job of playing all those notes, mm -hmm. partially because it has room to breathe. It's not yeah. always successful in all of its threads. Their Mr. Freeze was kind of bland, mm -hmm. but I like a lot of what they're doing on Gotham them and how they're putting those pieces together. It lost me during, I think it was the second season break. Mm. Is it Jada Pinkett? Is she the one that was in that one? Yeah, because I'm all the way up into season three now. Okay, yeah, like Jada Pinkett Smith's character, I was just kind of like, enough is enough. I felt like they had squeezed everything they could out of her, and I was just really tired of her being important. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was like it got to the break, and I was like, wait, I don't have to watch this. <laughs> if I'm not enjoying it, I don't have to watch it. And so I walked away, and maybe it got better. She was nice when she was part of Falcone of like the old era of criminal. Right. But then they kept bringing her back. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it was just like, I'm um, no. And then like, is this the Joker? Is this the Joker? He is the Joker. I don't care. No, that's the frustrating <laughs> thing is he is the Joker. They just contractually could not say the name Joker. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> what? what? Not interested. I know. It, well, it's you. weird. Like the rights are exclusive to the film. They cannot put what? the name Joker in a Batman live action TV series. They what? can in an animated series. So they had a character who is based. He is Joker. Uh -huh. They just cannot say the name Joker. And it's this weird contractual loophole they got stuck in that they were very frustrated by. <laughs> Anyways, so I think that will bring our episode <laughs> of Batman and Robin to a close, which I'm noticing the total recording time is the same as both halves of the Flatliners episode. <laughs> oh, my God. Why have we been talking three hours about this movie? I can't I mean... imagine if we had also got <laughs> song. We would have been kept going. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. yeah, we'd be going until midnight. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Thank yes, you, Nolan, for again thank joining you. us. <sighs> Angie, as always, thank you for putting up with everything that happened today. <laughs> so, good night, everybody. Good, good night. night. Cha ching. <laughs> For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit chumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Yes. Like people are complaining about a face-off reboot. I'm like, why do we not have 13 direct to video sequels by now? Yeah. <laughs> Where it's just like, let's get all the crappy action movie stars and have them swap faces. And let's be honest, if you give them a paycheck, Nick Cage will show up. You're probably right. I want the Dolph Lundgren, Lance Henriksen face-off. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Talk about contrast. I want the Keith David, David Keith face-off. Uh, I'd pay money for that. Still. <laughs> I want the Jackie Chan, Michelle Yeoh face-off. This is getting weird. Jackie Chan, Sam Hong? We'd have to uh, put Yun Bao in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah Three-way face-off. Yun Bio Bolo Young face-off. Yeah. Oh. <laughs>